Let me. Good afternoon, all again. A very warm greeting to each and every one of you. Welcome to a virtual One Health and CD Conference 2021 Phenomenon and Preparation for Future Cities. I am Thon Gamon Riang Bung, and I am the MC for this event. On behalf of organizing committee, we extend our appreciation for your participation for today. The purpose of this event is not only to highlight the importance of the One Health concept when the current phenomena of infectious disease in Southeast Asia are affecting the urban lives, including human, animal, the environment health, but also to create an open space to exchange knowledge and discuss how various professions can be integrated with the One Health concept at the forefront of planning for today and the near future. The event is a part of the conference cycle, Fong de Longbeck 2021, and co-organized by the Embassy of France in Thailand, the French Research Institute on Contemporary Southeast Asia, or ERASIC. Urban Design and Development Center, or UDDC, Jualongon University, along with Thai Health Promotion Foundation. The conference is two-way event running through 16th to 17th of December 2021 from 2 p.m. to 5 p.m. each day. Broadcast live on Facebook page and YouTube, UDDC, Urban Design and Development Center. And for the opening session today, this is my great honor to welcome the organizing committee to deliver the opening remarks. Let me start our program by welcoming the Deputy Head of Mission, Embassy of France to Thailand. Please welcome Kemi Lambert. Dear Dr. Pairol Sanwam, Assistant CEO of Thai Health Promotion Foundation, Dear Niramon Sirisakul, Director of Urban Design and Development Center, dear Jérôme Samuel, dear Christine Cabasse from IRASEC, dear speakers, moderators, dear attendees, ladies and gentlemen. I am very pleased to open this two-day conference on One Health and City, because France, through its diplomatic well, no. network, One well, no and in particular through the French research centers such as CIRAD, CNRS, IRASEC, IRD, as well as their regional colleagues from Southeast Asia, are very much involved in one health related programs. As a matter of fact, France has initiated the creation of the one health high level panel of oh. experts by FAO, WHO, OIE and UNEP. Among the 26 members of this panel, we are very proud to have here in Thailand the French expert on this issue. At the regional level, France is also funding the project One Health in Practice in Southeast Asia, which covers five countries, namely Cambodia, Laos, Malaysia, Myanmar and Vietnam, with the participation of Thai experts. France is also currently deploying several experts in Asia and the Pacific to work on One Health, biodiversity and climate change and their synergies. Next year, in 2022, France will chair the EU presidency. This year will be rich in major international events related to environmental issues like the One Ocean Summit in Brest in February and a commitment to the High Ambition Coalition. We will be very happy to bring our support here from Bangkok. Ladies and gentlemen, today's seminar is very special and I'm glad to open it because of its original perspective. As a matter of fact, One Health's concept is often understood in an environmental and biodiversity ways and more particularly as a study of the interface between wild or domestic fauna and humans. However, the broad development of cities, 
the urban growth in tropical regions have underlined the challenges at stake related to the close link existing between human, environmental and animal health on the one hand, and cities on the other hand. The planned and unplanned increasing urbanization, the soil artificialization, the effects of climate change and rising temperatures, the links between these issues and health and health care, and also the way governments and town planners make their best efforts to mitigate the risk, are among crucial topics that the speakers will focus upon during this seminar. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope this seminar will enrich our understanding of integrated potential policy actions implemented at the urban level. I wish you fruitful discussions. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much, Mr. Lambeck. Secondly, the Assistant CEO of Thai Health Promotion Foundation, please welcome Dr. Pairo Tsaunuam. Good afternoon, our participants. I am Dr. Pairo Saunuam on behalf of Thai Health Promotion Foundation. It is my honor to be a part of One Health City Conference uh, 2021, which aims to drive the issue about the One Health concept with urban to be the public issue, including promoting the knowledge to prepare for change in the future. We are grateful that international organization has attended about One Health issue which is related to our mission to inspire, motivate, coordinate, and empower individual and organization in our sectors for the enhancement of health promotive capacity, capability, as well as healthy city and environment to support the health promotion movement in Thailand. So we have been driving the healthy city issue with uh, UDDC for almost 10 years. For example, Good Work Thailand project that improved uh, workability in Bangkok and regional city in Thailand and other projects such as Green Bridge and Yanawa Riverfront, including raising awareness about the issue by using public relations. Finally, we hope this event will raise the awareness and activeness to everyone in the scope of education of human, animal, and the environment with the city health, as well as using the knowledge and example from the reason to prepare for the upcoming future. Thank you, and so Thank you very much, Dr. Sao Nguam. Next. Associate Professor at the Department of Urban and Regional Planning, Dulalongon University, and the Director of Urban Design and Development Center, UDDC. Please welcome Dr. Niramon Seri Sakun. Sawadika, uh, greetings to all participants of the One Health City Conference 2021 seminar. I am Niramon Seri Sakun, Director of the Urban Design and Development Center, Dulalongon University or UDDC. On behalf of the co-organizer of the conference uh, cycle from Dalamba 2021, this seminar is a part of the events. I would like to thank the Embassy of France in Thailand and for French Research Institute of Contemporary Southeast Asia or IRASEC CNIS MEAE for inviting UDC to take part in advancing and disseminating knowledge on health and urban development. Um, and for our collaboration over the years. And thank you to Thai Health Promotion Foundation for supporting UDDC mission towards promoting healthy city in Thailand. Finally, I sincerely hope that the One Health and um, City Conference 2021, which is a panel of speakers from various fields uh, of health environment and urban studies will be useful to all participants of this broadcast and the audience in retrospect. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. 
And last but not least, the director of Irasek, Dr. Jehom Samuel, please welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Rémi Lambert, Dr. Uh, Payroch, and Dr. Niramon. Dear all, good afternoon from Bangkok. Um, I would like to recall very quickly the framework in which this seminar is organized, or rather co-organized by the French Embassy, the Thai Health Promotion Foundation, the Urban Design and Development Center, UDDC, and the Institute of Research and Contemporary Southeast Asia, IRASEC, of which I'm the director. The Rector is a research center in the field of humanities and social sciences created 20 years ago and whose activities cover the 11 countries of Southeast Asia, including Thailand, of course, and Indonesia, among others. The present seminar is the last of the series of four events organized in 2021 around the same theme entitled Ecological and Civic Transitions in Southeast Asian cities, this theme being addressed through different approaches. The approach of the two half-day seminars today and tomorrow is that of health, as uh, all the, the speakers before me has uh, just reminded us. And finally, I would like to give a special thank to the, the person uh, daily involved in the organization of the seminar, Ajahn Niramon, director of UDDC, Christine Cabasset, deputy director of IRASEC, as well as Kun Munchushada and Kun Tanapon from UDDC. I wish you a meaningful afternoon with rich and fruitful exchanges. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you very much. And for the next panel discussion, our expert panelists would present and discuss about the One Health concept in different dimensions. First, the One Health approach for a growing urbanization by Dr. Cedric Morand from the French National Center for Scientific Research or CNRS. Secondly, Indonesian urbanization and health dimension in a changing climate evidence from Samarang and Pekalongan by Dr. Wiwandari Handayani and Dr. Raku Sediadi from the Department of Urban and Regional Planning, Diponegoro University. Thirdly, the post-pandemic city we want by Dr. Niramon Seri Sakun, the Director of Urban Design and Development Center. And finally, community-led COVID-19 responses addressing COVID-19 crisis in Bangkok through community empowerment and primary health care by Dr. Niteya Panupak, the executive director from the Institute of HIV Research and Innovation. And Associate Professor Tawida Agamonwet, the Dean of the County of Political Science, Thammasat University, will be our moderator for today. Now, I would like to give the floor to our moderator today. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Professor Tawida Agamonwet. Thank you very much, my lovely MC. And uh, welcome everyone to this uh, webinar of One Health and somehow we're looking at uh, city issues as well. Uh, it is my honor to be a moderator of today since I see all the names of the speakers and it's kind of like having me really alert of what we're gonna get today from the speakers. It's not very common as my own expertise and area of interest are in disaster risk and resilient city. I usually think that people from engineering, people from medical science, people from urban planning and people from governance and management, they usually come together, that's not a surprise. But when they try to talk on one another topic, which mean that what I call transdisciplinary is actually emerging you are coming from one discipline and then you actually taking the interest and issue to the other discipline and then have it put and pulled together. And then we somehow reflect on what lesson learned and also the details of the content that we are going to share. So this is really a good chance to me to sit here and listen for the most part. And perhaps I can also having a privilege of asking a very difficult question to all the speakers. I hold that privilege to me. 
Um, I'm going to do things like this. Let's get the arrangement to the listeners so that the audience know how I'm going to conduct this session. We are going to have first round of the four speakers. Each of them would actually deliver what they intend to for 15 minutes. I hope it's going to be 15 or more than 20 minutes. Um, and then when they, after they deliver each one of them, then the second round, I would pick up. So any audience went to drop any question, comment, want to challenge some of the speakers um, idea or content, do so. I will pick up that and then throw it back to the second round of the speaker. Either they answer the question that we drop or my fabulous questions, or even the question to one another among the speakers. We will do that as a second round. And then by the end, I might be able to go another round to the each of the speaker to give me a punch line so that UDDC can have a campaign after this webinar of the punch line of each speaker on their website. So this is what we're gonna do today for the next almost three hours together. Then I'm not going to introduce all of them right now. I'm only go one by one at the time that each speaker will speak. Then that would actually have you remember who a person is when they actually give the talk. The first one of the speaker today, I was trying to practice his name for a couple minutes. I'm actually going on from Sergey to Sergey. So Sergey. So let me call him Dr. Moran. That would be actually easier for me and not mistaken. What is really, really impressed me by his expertise and experience is he is practically a researcher. He's working with the French CNRS and CIRAT in, in, in France, of course, and associate with IRSEC. He also visiting professor at Mahidon University and Gazeta University, which almost gonna make him a wizard of uh, Thailand University by now. He have his own analysis and interlinkage between global change in a lot of health issues, societies, especially in Southeast Asia. So if we start from him, whom I believe that is coming out at time that we're confronting with this kind of COVID disease that been haunting us for the past almost two years already. Let's start by uh, Dr. Moran and then let's see what his reflection from his speech would be. So the floor is yours. Thank you very much for this uh, very nice uh, introduction. I'm very, very happy and I want to first to thank also the, the organizer and uh, the IRASEC and also a special thank to Adjani Ramon and all of our team for this uh, very uh, impressive uh, two days of, uh, of conference. And um, for me, yes, I'm, an, I'm, I'm a guy from uh, ecology and biodiversity, but more and more interesting on health, health issue because I came uh, to Southeast Asia. And uh, today, uh, today it was very special and during this, you're right, during these last two years, because you have just to remember uh, almost two years ago when uh, China locked down 18 million of urban uh, people. And it was for almost people unbelievable. We said that only China can do this, but actually it happened quite everywhere in the world. And uh, it, struck, it struck directly uh, the cities and the big cities. And we have to understand a little bit how and what will be the response. We have to remember because at the very beginning when there was something to intend the social distancing uh, between people, you have to, to see that Singapore that is always at the forefront of the innovation, develop a, a, a robot dog just to remind the people when they saw, they saw two people too close in a, bank, in a Singapore uh, park, to make distance between them, to, uh, to avoid the super spreading of COVID-19. Really shortly after, after this, and really on 2020, uh, we have this, uh, this, uh, all of these uh, breakouts uh, several ways ago, like the OS OECD, like the city policy responses and the categories two of city policy responses around COVID special uh, social distancing, but also the how to, to, to better uh, protect ourselves and protect the other one. Really, so the cities was at the river front. Why? Because we are a globalized planet. 
uh, we have to remember that uh, the increase of the air passenger travel. In 1970, we were less than 400 million to take the plane. 2019, just before the, the crash, I would have to say of the, of, the, of the travel, we were more than 4 billion, 1,300,000 1, people. Or of course, mostly connected by the big cities all around the world, especially Asia to Europe or to North America. The same are for the air freight, which was also increased by almost 1,300% in this period. All of this means that is the globalization of travel means that every disease that start, epidemics that start to spread locally on that reach a big cities have a big chance to, uh, to globalize, to be all around the world in a, few, in a few months, like it was for the COVID-19. And we have to understand that this is not new. Uh, actually, we face a great acceleration of epidemics for a long time ago. If I take the data, the data from 1960 up to now, we have the increasing number of outbreaks for humans on zoonotic disease, so related to animals, wildlife or domestic, outbreak of vector-borne disease, and some of them are really uh, hurting the, 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 the big cities, but also outbreak of livestock and poultry for the, for the livestock and poultry or outbreaks of wildlife disease. So a big increase of the vector-borne disease. We have no time today to really understand the, the drivers. So we can discuss a little bit after the drivers of these uh, epidemics, which are mostly local, but that spread globally. But these are really to be in, uh, understood into the ongoing race of the, of the cities. We have to see that we have a major change that have happened all over the world. Now, the majority of population lives in cities and they will live much, much more. In 2050, it will be more than 60, or maybe up to 70% of people that will live in city. In Europe, for example, you have a decrease of number of people living in rural population, but of course, in some other place, it will be not. Especially what is important, the increase of the urban population will be mostly in intertropical region, in Asia, in Africa, or in Central and uh, South America. A place where there is also a high density of cattle, of poultry, uh, of big population, of also on biodiversity. So we have all of this connection between urbanization, high density of the urban population within a changing environment with a high diversity, but also a high density of cattle and poultry. So the expansion of this world city, and especially in the intertropical inter region, is favoring the new ecological niches for infectious disease. So it really alters a lot, and especially uh, in, in several ways. And we are facing some two kinds of cities in the Northern Europe or Northern America <clears throat> with, more, with the city that's starting to be more and more greening and the expansion continue, but a little bit less. But in the intertropical region and the cities in this place where there is still an expansion, the big expansion of the cities, in a rural environment and with a new interaction between people and nature. That's why now the, the One Health uh, that will explain as an important way to tackle the problem of the cities and the human health population, especially the urban health population. That's why also the, just after the COVID-19, uh, the FAO, OIE, UNEP and WHO uh, in following the Paris Peace Forum, uh, decided to create a multidisciplinary One Health high-level expert panel and thanks uh, with the support on France and Germany. The chance to be with there, so we're starting to work really uh, uh, in May of this year, uh, work a lot, but we are in the way to, to present uh, for the first time a new definition of the One Health. And this new definition of the One Health, I give you, it was only launched and um, supported by the tripartite and the FAO, OAE, WHO, and UN, and the statement. And saying what? 
saying that One Health is an integrated, unifying approach that aims to sustainably balance and optimize the health of people, animals, and ecosystem. It recognizes that the health of humans, animals, plants, and the wider environment are closely linked and interdependent. But this approach mobilizes multi -se multiple sectors, disciplines, and communities at varying levels of society to work together to foster well-being. And this is also to, to tackle the threat to health and ecosystem, but also to address the collective need for clean water, energy on air, uh, safe and nutritious, nutritious food, taking action on climate change and contributing to sustainable development. You see, that is a very broad and large approach, which means that we and we understand that it was closely related with this introduction of our, of our symposium. We need more interface and in collaboration between sectors and discipline from the environment, from the animals, from the humans. We need better coordination among society, rural, urban, and mobile, com mobile communities at local, on national, regional, or global integrating inclusivity, equity, and access, all of two together to uh, improve the capacity building for one else, for healthy ecosystem, healthy animals, healthy uh, humans, and better communicate. But we have to say that, and we are right, as we work a lot between the livestock, wildlife, and humans, uh, we sometimes on too much in the one else, uh, forget the urban and the urban cities. But we have to, to work on this, and especially thanks for people that are working in biodiversity and uh, working at what we name the planning uh, resilient uh, cities, so to better integrate nature into urban design and planning. And uh, this is something that starting also uh, several years ago, but that are really found a new uh, booster with the with the pandemics, with the COVID pandemic. So uh, better uh, cities in the world, better smart cities uh, to a uh, better uh, uh, slow down and to, uh, to, to be uh, more prone to, uh, re to be resilient against uh, new pandemics. Actually, this is not new. Uh, just to remember you that the, the, city, uh, the, the garden in the, the city or the city in the garden was long time uh, plan, uh, the garden city solution, uh, it was already proposed uh, uh, in New York, London, Paris, Berlin, uh, in, in the beginning of, the, of the, the first century. So quite interesting about uh, this way that we have to recognize uh, on interesting by this uh, old uh, vision of the, the planning, but to put more nature and biodiversity. And we know, we know that there are uh, uh, potential, we, uh, potential uh, interesting way. We know that uh, green spaces are very important for the cognitive development of school children. This has been several times proved, especially in Barcelona and the city of Barcelona in Spain or Catalonia, uh, starting also to really implement in its policy, uh, building a, a, a green metropolis. So looking to green infrastructure, but also to preserve ecosystem services and to uh, work for the well-being of the population, especially the, 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 the young generation. It was also the case, for example, in Paris, uh, where there was uh, the project now starting to uh, naturing the playground school that was only before with uh, concrete, but also to help. But it's also a place where the old people can go uh, when, when the school uh, is uh, without, uh, without children to open. This is something also that's starting to, uh, to, to start in, uh, in Asian cities. We have to remember the, the greening space uh, uh, in uh, the green spaces uh, in Asian city are, are very low. Huh? When you see the, the city in Vietnam or in, uh, in Indonesia or even in Bangkok and Philippines uh, compared to uh, Kuala Lumpur, Singapore or Hong Kong. Even in Singapore or Hong Kong are a little bit different. But this is uh, the, the quite interesting way, and I will just uh, to, to show some, uh, some example uh, from, uh, from uh, Singapore, 
that tackle, but it's the same in Tokyo, huh? that tackle the problem of uh, older people on how to preserve the well-being and the living in good health for, for, for aging people when you are less and less young and uh, facing also the cost uh, for the, the potentially for the public health. Why, how, but mostly by implementing a better connection between uh, aging people and nature by designing uh, therapeutic gardens in, in, in Singapore. And, and this was already uh, built on the knowledge of scientific knowledge on the, the environmental psychology and uh, to on, on the user really uh, planning uh, with stakeholders. So the user, but the garden operation staff, the healthcare professional, and of course, the land caps uh, architect, designers and academics to work all the, together to uh, involve all of these, to identify how to do and to after to, to program uh, together uh, this kind of therapeutic garden. It was also to the case uh, for several aspects in the hospital or in the public park of this. So nature-based solution are uh, starting to be, uh, to be widespread in, uh, in uh, many cities uh, around the world uh, uh, to uh, better to renaturing cities. So to put more diversity, biodiversity on nature that have several kinds of uh, uh, options, several kinds of benefit for human well-being. Have you seen before, have we have seen before uh, for the older generation and the younger generation, but it improves also the resilience uh, around the, the climate change uh, to, to the each other, but also the air pollution. So it make urban cities to more sustainable and also uh, facing the different problem. Now we have only to think a little bit how to implement this in a way that is also working on the ecosystem to regulate uh, the disease uh, epidemics. So this is the, the, the way to how to design now uh, cities where people or nature can both flourish. And one thing that sometimes people are asking, ah, oh, but maybe this can be also uh, the good way. You put nature in cities, so you will have more uh, a place for uh, mosquitoes to breed, and you can have uh, more uh, outbreaks of uh, of uh, dinghy, for example, or even chikungunya. Potentially yes, and potentially no, because it's depending on the way you will renaturing the place. So that's why now we need to, uh, to address also these questions to the disease ecologists and to the health practitioner or the surveillance health to better design a way that you also potentially using nature to control uh, the vector uh, of, uh, uh, of, uh, of disease. So I will finish uh, this and to, to leave more time to, uh, to discuss uh, all of us. Uh, we have to, uh, to, to realize and to implement the future cities we want for all. Cities that will be uh, only a way to support pandemics and lockdown, or cities that we are, will be happy to live and also resilience against climate change, but resilience against the impact of uh, pandemics and epidemics using uh, urban forestry and greening cities. So using the ecosystem services that are providing by biodiversity that could be implemented uh, in city. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Moran. I actually, if I can steal a little minute here, um, I have a really funny question, not, not a very serious one yet, just a little cutie thing. When, when, when I look at therapeutic uh, garden in, in Singapore, um, and I know that uh, One Health and also uh, what we found of is providing platforms so that stakeholders and those diverse needs can be heard and then can be integrated into the design. That's, that's what we really expecting for. But then just a quick one, if I ask you on top of your head, how should we start to make people care? 
because sometimes, especially in the mega city, outskirt of the urbanization, they're kind of like too busy with their life. And then um, so much of the problem uh, in the daytime kind of way. So, so they just don't care about anything anymore. To, to make people care enough to kickstart and then cooperate. What would be first thing that you do? A lot, what is in, this is a very good question. What is interesting in the, I would say the, the peri-urban, so it's really close to the, to the village way of life, <clears throat> which means that you still have village. So you still have a primary care unit. Uh, you still have the, the health volunteers. You still, you have this uh, kind of community uh, engagement uh, for their community. So you can, as uh, we did uh, in, the, in the rural way, in the rural uh, uh, landscape, that we can base our common activities with the help of the primary care unit. And there is something, something that are quite very interesting because when you look at the way, uh, where, where the place there is still nature, uh, you can see the place. People are not really care about uh, to put plants around, but when they're starting to have a, a, a loss of nature to be in contact, even in, the, in some place that are very, the place are not very so friendly, and especially when it's so friendly, people are putting plants. So you see the big uh, condo, and uh, the, for, for, for local people that are starting that are very, not very nice, you see plants, people are putting plants, putting plants here, which means that they need this contact. And I think we can start with this, why they are putting plants, why they want to put plants on this. And starting with this, with their uh, needed, we can build up something, I'm pretty sure. I would be very interesting to, to, go, to, to, to go to this. Thank you very much. It's just, it's just um, kind of like when I, when I actually saw everything and put in it together, I said, oh, how should we start to make people actually care and turn around? So thank you very much. Let me move to the next um, two speakers actually coming as a pair. Uh, we are having uh, our uh, famous and high reputation from, I'm sorry. Um, okay, from... It's not from my side, right? I'm sorry. Um, so we have been them joining us from Indonesia. Um, they are uh, uh, Wiwandari Handayani from uh, Department of Urban and Regional Planning Faculty of Engineering at uh, Diponegoro University in Indonesia. Also with Professor Ruku Setiadi from the same department and, and university that actually both of them are the expert I can call it regional planning and urbanization, also resilient city. For Professor Wiwandari, uh, as a very familiar face, <laughs> I just met her as well in the defense of flat resilient city in Netherlands. And uh, her expertise also actually focusing on urban and regional resilience, mostly the context of disaster risk management. Uh, welcome to our world. <laughs> and for the Professor Ruku, his, um, expertise and his interest is actually on intellectual space. This phrase is really impressed to me. The intellectual space between urbanization and environment are particularly in various contemporary urban topics such as climate change, healthy urban ecosystem and resilience. So let I leave the floor to both of you. The floor is, uh, is yours. <laughs> Thank you very much for giving us an uh, opportunity uh, to share some experience from Indonesia. And please allow me to sh uh, share uh, the screen first. And for, the for this opportunity, we would like to present uh, some highlights from uh, the whole Indonesia. Uh, I would like to start a little bit uh, talking about urbanization and the health dimension. And um, I'm sorry, is it already so as a share screen in your place or? No, nope, it's have not um, coming out yet. I see, but you already see my screen, yeah? Uh, it, it, it said that you share, but we have not seen it browsed up yet. Is it only me that have not seen it? 
No, no, we can, I cannot see oh, too. Okay. I cannot see it. I see. Yeah, it's suddenly fresh in my sight. I don't understand why. You might wanna you might wanna close the file and then try it again. Okay, okay. Uh, maybe Paroko, could you yeah. please uh, uh, take I will care? Try. Yeah. yeah. I will try I'm to sorry. share the screen. Yeah. But then I cannot see. <laughs> I don't know, suddenly something goes wrong with this. Okay, because somebody else still use the screen, maybe uh, it's you. Who yeah, it should be me, but it's, it's oh my God. I'm oh, sorry. because you are frozen. Um, Professor, okay. we to be, you might have to leave and then signing in again. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm That's sorry. That's the only yeah. way that, that you can free the screen. I'm sorry. Okay, okay, okay. I'm sorry, it's suddenly, and I... That's okay. We will wait for you to come back. Uh... Can never happen okay. before. Ah, please, Maruko. <laughs> okay. I'm sorry. Please, Maruko. Do you want to continue with the sharing screen? Yeah, yeah, maybe you can share the screen, yeah, because I'm afraid it happens again to me and then we can start. Okay, I'll try. Uh, which one? I think. That is just in case uh, when Professor yeah. Ruku is sharing. Um, okay, ah, perfect, perfect. Yeah, thank you. And sorry again. Uh, let me immediately start because we already uh, lose some times. Yeah. Uh, for uh, now, we I would like to start. Um, we are not seeing the slide. Yeah, it suddenly disappeared. <laughs> oh my god. Can you see this slide? No. No. It oh. was, but not now. Yeah. Pro Professor, we wondering can you can you send the file presentation file to me in the chat box? Okay, okay, okay. I will try. Sure, sure. Yeah. Um, Professor Ruku, just one more time. Can you try to share it again? Let's see if it works. If okay. it's not, I'm going to try. Okay, okay. No, I will try. Oh, you will try or I will try, Paruko? You will try. Okay, let you try. Oh, wait, wait. Please, wait, wait. Maybe. <laughs> yeah. Maybe better not to make it as the slideshow, just to reduce yep, it. Yeah, it's up here already. You go ahead. It's yeah, okay. Fine. Yeah. Thank you again. Uh, I hope from now on we can running smoothly. And I would like to immediately start with... Uh, some highlights uh, focusing on the climate change and health issues. Uh, and then uh, we would like to talk a little bit uh, the urbanization in Indonesia. And then uh, later on, Pa Ruko will uh, uh, elaborate some uh, highlight from Semarang and Pekalongan. Uh, there are two uh, cities uh, along the northern coast of Semarang, uh, of, sorry, of uh, Java Island. Those are quite uh, highly impacted by the climate change, and uh, uh, Paruko has some uh, research uh, related to the the degradation of the environment uh, in relation to the health. And yeah, uh, to start, uh, I think what we would like to present it's really related with the earlier presentation uh, concerning on the health and urbanization. But uh, for uh, exploring the case of Indonesia, we would like to uh, set the narrative uh, from the climate change and how the climate uh, affects health. I think uh, all of us have been aware that, of course, the climate change uh, direct or indirectly will affect health. Yeah, the rising temperatures, extreme weather, the air quality impact, yeah, even the factor-borne disease is very much related with the climate change phenomenon. And there are, of course, environmental effects as there are more frequent heat waves, for example, and I think flood at the moment regards as the most frequent disaster take place uh, globally and of course, including in Asia. And there is also why we talk a lot yeah, about flood resilience, for example. And 
all of this, this kind of climate change disaster uh, directly and also uh, indirectly give secondary and uh, secondary effect and, the, and at the end of the day also will uh, uh, lead to the kind of various types of disease and health effect. Um, in Indonesia, I think uh, the, the, the cases, yeah, because of uh, the urban heat island effect, for example, and because of, uh, let's say, flood or other climate change disasters already become like a concern. And it's also has been uh, lead to some studies concerning on uh, the health issues. Uh, for example, uh, ma diary, diarrhea or even uh, dengue is two most uh, kind of uh, highlighted type of the, uh, disease yeah, that mostly related to the climate change impact. And uh, because we are from the urban planning background and we believe that uh, urban planning and design should contribute something yeah, to minimize the climate change impact. Um, uh, Dr. Moran has mentioned about uh, proposing concept like, like smart city, resilient city, uh, including there are a lot of uh, discussion and uh, conversation where, about blue and green uh, infrastructures, blue and green concept in urban development, mm -hmm. nature-based solution. That kind of concept, uh, conversations becomes more important and important. And I believe it is also closely related with our understanding on the climate change uh, impact. Can you make it slide show, will it? Yeah. Uh, um, I'm afraid if we put it in this full screen, then oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you're fine with this one. <laughs> okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, back to the case of Indonesia, yeah, because we are uh, in the tropical country, uh, there are some particular disease, yeah, very much. Uh, influenced by the climate actually. Uh, the high concern for from the government actually, uh, there are a lot of uh, initiative uh, to monitor and also control the dengue because of the mosquitoes. Uh, as you know, there, there are various types of uh, disease because of the climate, uh, because of uh, related to the animals, yeah, rat, mosquitoes, and also uh, because of the uh, lack of clean water that leads to kind of uh, disease like diarrhea and skin allergens and also because of the climate uh, that create pollutants for example and then it uh, leads to uh, other types of disease and uh, for the Indonesian case itself uh, it seems like uh, the government uh, put some concern uh, of the dengue because even in in the uh, global uh, Google numbers, we, we, we see a lot of uh, cases, yeah, uh, because of uh, this uh, kind of subtropical or tropical disease uh, that costs more than three, uh, 319 million people to be infected every year uh, with dengue. It's just an example. I mean, there's some uh, types of disease, but uh, I think. Uh, Dengue uh, can be regarded as one example to show how uh, we can see health become an important and closely related with the uh, climate change and urbanization. Uh, why? Because like uh, we try to uh, describe in uh, on the figure, as you can see on the slide, that the, the highest dengue uh, cases in Indonesia, for example, take place in, uh, in a very dense uh, area, uh, like in Java, yeah, in West Java, East Java, Central Java, Jakarta is one. It's like the densest uh, uh, area in Indonesia. And it is also shown there's a lot of cases uh, take place in this kind of area. And focusing on uh, that kind of issues in the context of demography and, and urbanization when we talk about Indonesia, I would like to emphasize a little bit about the population distribution because I believe this climate change impact also related to the, the way the urban growth and activity even or not evenly distributed. Uh, in Indonesia at the moment, uh, most of the people live in Java Island, uh, close to 60%, even more than 60%, while the Java Island itself only allocate 
collected in the less than 7% of the total Indonesia. So you can imagine how dense the Java Island compared to the whole part of Indonesia, while 60% of Indonesian people live only in this, uh, in this island, yeah, uh, where Jakarta, Bandung, Semara, and Surabaya are located. There are, uh, let's say, top four big cities in, in Indonesia. Um, and there, and learn from the dengue fever cases, we can see also there's a lot of uh, cases uh, take place in, in this area. And um, I would like also to a uh, little bit highlight that the urbanizations indeed become uh, an important issue. Uh, as uh, you can uh, see here, for, based on the census data in 2010 and 2020, uh, up to 2045, there are quite significant uh, numbers yeah, of people will be live in, in cities. And the problem is they are located only in a certain area, certain big cities. Uh, Dr. Moran has mentioned about the urban sprawl. They're located on the, uh, in a very big urban center and then the, 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 the city spread uh, into the surrounding regions and creating the sprawl or corridor development that creating a kind of unbalanced density and unbalanced development. And for the Indonesian case, for example, when we a little bit zoom in into Java Island, like you see on the slide, and uh, we can see, for example, in the northern coast of Java Island, there's a very dense uh, area along the coast. Or most of the big cities in the world, including in Asia, including in Indonesia, is located uh, at, uh, on the coast where there are a lot of people live there. And the development, the urban growth pattern spread unevenly, and it leads to a lot of uh, challenge or increasing the risk uh, because of the climate change impact. Uh, if we talk about the northern coast as the densest area, I may say in Indonesia, uh, it has been a lot of uh, issues related to the decreasing quality of the environment because of the coastal er er erosion, tidal inundation because of flood, water supply, and so on that is in the end will relate it to uh, the health. Yeah, Like I, I mentioned before, when we try to show you some fact about the dengue as uh, one case, if we try to connect urbanization, climate change, and health issues, then I think it's time for us to put more attention on kind of multidisciplinary perspective to understand the, the phenomenon. And from this part, I would like to invite Pak Ruku to continue and move on to the more detailed case in Pekalongan and Semarang. Please, yes. Pak Ruku. Well, uh, thank you, uh, Bu Wiwi. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you, moderator, organizer, French Embassy, and thank you as well for UCDC, Sudalangkau University, and greeting to all my fellow presenters here. Uh, please allow me to continue the presentation, uh, would you please do uh, make it a uh, full screen? I will take the risk. Okay. Ah, it works now. Okay, please uh, continue. No <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, okay. That's great. Well, uh, I would like to look at more uh, deeper uh, with a case study area in two cities in uh, central Java. One of them is Semarang and the other one is uh, Pekalongan City. Uh, so in each city, I choose to uh, spot uh, and this case study uh, present a different settlement typology in Indonesia, particularly for low income community. Uh, because millions of people who are in the bottom of the pyramids in Indonesia live in this kind of conditions. And then it is challenging because uh, looking solution for them is not easy. And uh, the case study also include uh, informal settlement in, in its respective cities and also include a type of projects to address housing issue in Indonesia through uh, public vertical housing. 
So uh, I would like to go to next slide, which uh, elaborates uh, each uh, case study. But I will not spend because of time the too much in this slide because uh, we have a story behind this case study. But I think because of time, I would like to go through uh, the first case study is in Tologomulo sub district. It is in the city of Semarang, and it is a typology of urban kampung, urban kampung, uh, urban settlement, or we call it kampung, and. In this uh, area, we have a neighborhood uh, for about 85 households, and it's a dense. This area is a, is a project in the 1970s, uh, when uh, our president gave a project to this area as a relocation of traditional market in the city. Uh, and then this area is a lack of intervention after its establishment, and then quite decreasing. Uh, the quality of life over there, the quality of situation over there, condition, and it's about 60% uh, of adults in this neighborhood are self-employed. They collect used tire uh, type for input for other rubber-based product. And then they keep uh, the tires in the front of houses and along the neighborhood streets, uh, hundred of tires become a pocket of uh, water after, uh, during the rainy season and then become a fertile ground for uh, most people to breed uh, in the dry season. And there is uh, increased flood intensity and hot days that are filled by people in this neighborhood. The second case study is located in sub district. It is a different city, not in the Semarang, but it's in Pekalongan. Uh, the, this, this neighborhood are populated by 100 households. Uh, this neighborhood was established informally without proper and legitimate development planning procedure as a part of euphoria, euphoria decentralization reform in the end of 1990s following the collapse of President Suharto regimes. Local people who were mostly uh, from marginal groups uh, appropriated vacant lands and built housing in this area. And then there is some intervention, but it is not continued because this area is uh, to somehow is uh, illegal. It's not belong to community. It's belong to a uh, state, which is not for development, basically. And in this area, people are uh, hot, hot at temperature started to increase. Well, flood intensity is also getting higher, according to people living in uh, this neighborhood. Well, and then uh, oh, next, uh, next slide, please. Uh, no, no, before this one. Okay, yes. Uh, and then uh, this is the, the, the third case study. The, case, the third case study is, uh, uh, is a typical of vertical, public vertical housing. Uh, the third case study has an area of six hectares, which is located in the uh, sub-district Kaligawe in the city of Semarang. It consists of seven twin block unit of vertical public housing, uh, approximately one, uh, 650 household uh, living in this neighborhood. Uh, the toll road uh, stretches on the west of this neighborhood on the East Low Flat Canal, which is one of the main river system of the city. Uh, and then in between of the river and the canal, uh, there is a water retention pool for flood control, a traditional market, and natural pond. Uh, the history of this neighborhood goes back in 1970s when the government uh, developed toll road and some people uh, uh, get compensation and then they are located in this uh, tower. And then the rest, the rest of the tower, uh, the four uh, twin blocks, is uh, belong to the government and it is for renting for the community. And then uh, in this area, in this neighborhood, most people concerned with increasing uh, flood intensity uh, than air hotter at temperatures. And the last case study is situated in Selamaran. Selamaran is a one of sub district in the in Pekalongan city. Uh, the neighborhood covers an area of approximately two hectares and consists of three twin blocks of vertical housing with almost uh, 280 units. Uh, and then uh, it is established in 2007 and operating since 2009. And this area 
this 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 project is a construction of vertical public housing in this neighborhood was part of the housing development program initiated by national government to uh, public departments and then uh, people in this area uh, the neighborhood the neighborhood in this area has uh, no issue with the floods because as the complex was built in a location that is higher than the surrounding settlements and Java see uh, about 1.5 kilometers to the north wherever people living in this uh, neighborhood started to confirm about the uh, the increasing of uh, hotter air temperatures okay that is the overview broad overview of the case study and then the data we collect the data uh, uh, link, uh, we conducted a longitudinal survey in 2014 and 2021 with a simple simple random sampling in the same neighborhood we asked to uh, respondents in household to represent all information about his or her family members. Uh, we then treat the data in its neighborhoods and compare the data based on the urban settlement typology. And then uh, using an, uh, and we using a number of indicators, including health indicators such as uh, daily. Uh, daily is a disability adjusted life years that I will uh, give a, a will, will explanation shorter later. But uh, okay. And this uh, slide shows that uh, more and more people in this uh, four neighborhoods uh, have increased stressful emotion uh, during hot days and uh, flood. Uh, these two uh, phenomena is uh, two major uh, climate change driver in this uh, area. And then uh, we try to compare not only about their uh, non-physical uh, situation, but also from health uh, point of view. Uh, we use a health indicator, which is a daily. Daily is the sum of two sub-indicators uh, known as a year's life loss, or YLL, uh, due to premature death and uh, years of live with disability. Well, uh, years life loss uh, calculates the average gap between the age of death and the maximum life of expectancy, while uh, YLD, YLD calculates the average, calculate the average time loss due to injury or duration of illness, which is experienced by each individual in particular geographic regions or country. Okay, next please. Well, uh, our study shows that uh, from physical indicators, uh, public uh, vertical housing was equipped uh, with better infrastructures and public services. And then uh, they also have uh, had a lower risk from flood and hot days and had less problem with the land titles in comparison to urban campus. Uh, however, we can see that there is a declining in the infrastructure performance and quality in these neighborhoods, such as uh, in, the, in terms of uh, drainage and water. For example, although the neighborhood in public vertical housing has public wells, none of the wells provide drinkable water, uh, the people therefore have to rely on water vendors uh, who regularly visit the neighborhood and pay for their drinking water. As well as drainage system in this neighborhood as well, not, uh, not well maintained uh, and in some part are not equipped all, at all. Uh, the situation combin uh, in combination with climate uh, change presents a challenge for health uh, of the inhabitants. However, public vertical uh, housing uh, promotes a healthier neighborhood through the reduction of disease factors, especially uh, mice or rats, uh, but not with the mosquito. Uh, we also find that uh, there is no relationship actually between the neighborhood typology with the case of diarrhea, respiratory problems, and skin disease. However, it is confirmed based on our longitudinal survey that public vertical housing uh, lower risk of dengue fever. Uh, it is consistent in our uh, two 
period of survey. Meanwhile, uh, skin disease increased significantly in Pekalongan uh, urban kampung, which is connected to water problems and water pollution from textile and batik production. The water uh, in this urban kampung uh, is black because the flow of batik jay mix with variety of domestic waste. But the industry in this area employs 70% uh, of adult uh, in the city. So they are, uh, their livelihood is creates their own uh, problem as well. In terms of uh, yes, life loss due to direct uh, life loss due to direct climate uh, extreme event is actually zero. Okay, there is no fatalities uh, due to extreme events uh, consistently uh, in all cases. However, considering any reason of that, YLL years life loss in urban kampung uh, was higher than YLL in public vertical housing in 2014. Uh, there is no case of uh, life loss in uh, vertical public housing. However, in 2021, there is an increasing uh, YLL in vertical public housing in the range of uh, 0 0.12 to 0 0.76. Uh, which equal to a shorter life expectancy, life expectancy of people living in the public vertical housing by 1.5 to 9 months. Okay, and then uh, so there is something wrong with uh, public vertical housing that we indicated before, such as decline in its physical condition indicators. It also because an increasing exposure of public vertical housing from flood, especially in the case of Samara. However, there is a good news about the decrease, decreasing of YLL in urban kampung. Decreasing YLL means a good news uh, because uh, people uh, living in the urban kampung are able to experience a longer uh, life of expectancy, ranging, ranging from 6.6 ranging from months in the city of Pekalongan to two years in the city of Semarang. And, uh, what happened in the case study, I think in line with a global trend in which there has been a dramatic improvement in life expectancy in most part of the world uh, in the 20th century. Uh, and most, uh, most in, in most countries, including in Indonesia, for example, in Indonesia, it is consistent that uh, life expectancy increase over the last decade, uh, either at the national level, regional level, at the city or uh, district level. Well, in terms of uh, years life with disability, it was uh, considerably low in the public vertical housing in Pekalongan, then in urban kampung in Semarang, uh, and in urban kampung in Semarang. However, now uh, it increased significantly almost, almost in all cases, okay? It means that uh, it shows that the impact of climate change uh, is more intense than before. Years of life with disability due to direct climate change is uh, climate uh, extreme event is increasing, but uh, there is no connection with the neighborhood typology. The level of exposure of the neighborhood uh, to flood is more influencing than uh, the the, the, the neighborhood typology itself, okay. The average years of life with disability, I think we have to come back to previous slides. The average uh, years of life with disability for population living in the case study are ranging from two years and 10 weeks to three years and 10 months in the overall individual uh, individual's lifespan, okay. So what happened in this case study, also in line with the previous study, that years life with disability have tended to increase in most of countries. And uh, because we, we have a better uh, uh, health service, uh, although the, there is increasing uh, uh, unprecedented uh, disaster due to climate change. Well, uh, the next slide please, the next slide. Uh, in the next slide, we will uh, we will give some conclusion from our study. 
uh, general conclusion that I think from the uh, the, the first uh, section that's uh, unbalanced urbanization that leads to unbalanced density uh, is a uh, lead to unbalanced density. Most rapid growing cities uh, is located in the coastal area in Indonesia with high risk of climate change impacts. And urbanization in Asia, including in Indonesia, is characterized by the existence of informal sector that leads to quite massive growth of slum and squatter that we just uh, show in the case of Semarang and Pekalongan. Uh, urbanization trends are associated with increasing climate-related health risks. And for the case specific, uh, the health of urban population, particularly low income living in less advantaged, advantaged sites in Indonesian cities is likely sensitive to the shift in weather patterns and other aspects of climate change extreme leading to public health issue. These effects occur directly due to changes in temperature and precipitation leading to occurrence of hotter days and floods. A different typology of settlement delivered some variation on health-related effects. However, it is not the main determinant of health outcomes of the population. Uh, direct impacts of climate change leading to fatalities is very low, especially with improved health service and access, but it leads to increasing of people's disability due to sickness, especially from diarrhea and skin disease over their lifespan. Indirectly, indirectly, community health outcome is also damaged by damaged by people made environmental disruption itself because they contaminate their water uh, untreated waste. They have untreated waste and they uh, pollute the river with the water sources. It's also a great problem for themselves. If urban development does not benefit the poor, the health effect of climate change will persist and be exacerbated in the future. And then at the last slide, we uh, give some future direction. I think it's quite broad direction, which uh, in line as well with Dr. Moran's uh, presentation that good living environment is a fundamental element to create healthier quality of life. Uh, we here need to re-emphasize that urban planning history itself stands for public crisis, crisis that remain persistent, persistent to date. That's why the, the story starts from the garden cities in London, Paris. And I think it's, uh, we need to understand that the problem remains persist to date. And then uh, we need to acknowledge that urban planning should have co benefit for climate and health. And then uh, urban program, urban development programs that are effective in the short term for healthier cities and society are programs that implement uh, basic health measures such as provision of clean water, sanitation, and then don't forget with the increasing capacity of disaster preparedness and response because the increasing uh, disaster due to climate change, and then uh, it doesn't lead to fatalities, but that increase to uh, disability, and we have we have to consider about that and affiliate poverty. I think is very critical as well. And in the long term, urban planning must be more transformative through programs such as uh, regeneration of declining urban settlements, uh, which is maybe easy in a, a wealthier uh, segment of the city, but will be challenging in this uh, slums or squatter situation. And then as well, restoration of natural environment in cities to address climate change and better public health, such as what a lot of uh, idea that uh, presented by previous uh, presenter, Dr. Moran, about uh, natural-based solutions and 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 uh, green blue infrastructure. I think is very important uh, for our investment in the future. Thank you so much. I think that's all for uh, from us. Uh, I'm sorry if it takes too long, uh, time too long. Thank you. Back to Thank the moderator. Thank you very much. Thank you for both of you. Actually, I to myself have uh, several questions, but let, let me hold that to the second round first so that um, I can move for, for, for the third uh, presentation and then I will come back to, to my question. Um, next speakers from a very familiar face to me um, and um, very close in terms of relation, I guess. Uh, um, she's actually 
uh, working as usually I don't do formal introduction uh, for her, but today I'm going to do that before I'm doing my funny thing. Uh, uh, Professor Niramon is uh, working at Jalalongon University at the Department of Urban and Regional Planning. And her topics today is the kind of like the city in the future that we want, which going to answer perhaps the last slide uh, that we actually just saw of in the long term, we want city in, in what way? And her work is actually with the um, urban design. She is currently a co-founder and director of Urban Design and Development Center, UDDZ. I usually call it that way. And she works a lot with Bangkok Authority and many stakeholders. Um, I see her work with the stakeholders and through the platform that she actually um, oftenly do with the communities and other Thai governments and local governments. Also, she worked closely with the French um, kind of research institutes and perhaps she perhaps combined, I guess, because um, she got her degree from Japan and she also very familiar with the work in France. So we're gonna have kind of like contemporary of the European and Asian kind of thing. And one of the most thing usually when I introduce her is I like her style. And you will see her style through her presentation. It's a Niramon ka? The time is yours ka. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ajahn Tavida, for a very kind um, introduction. And uh, thank you, um, Serge and Vibandari Ruku, for um, a very um, extensive and like uh, the presenta presentation that uh, give us a, a big picture, the big framework um, for this conference. So for my conference, uh, for my presentation, maybe I go um, a little bit uh, small in a smaller scale in um, urban design at the city and neighborhood level with a reference case of Bangkok. So, um, uh, okay, let's start. Um, today marks nearly two years that we all have, uh, we are having, uh, we are we are all having uh, to adjust to a new lifestyle that require wearing a mask, um, working and studying from home more than ever before. Um, enough time had lapsed that uh, in the COVID era that uh, we can begin to take stock of what the pandemic has told us about the city in the time of a global crisis like this. The first issue is that uh, whether the city we live in has enabled us to maintain a good quality of life or not and how. Conversely, what shortcoming in urban life has a pandemic exposed that we need to fix uh, before the next calamity. And the next, uh, the, the second issue is that in an environment in which the city continues to become larger, denser, and more risk prone, like uh, Sash um, has uh, mentioned, how can we plan to successfully cope with the future crisis like COVID pandemic? Um, these are profile issues which um, need um, a lengthy debate. So uh, with uh, the time limitation of the today presentation, I would like just to address this issue in the context of Bangkok readiness to cope with a crisis like uh, COVID-19, such as um, such an assessment may lead to the creation of the new urban design standard for the future. If the COVID a a pandemic persists, how should Bangkok start preparing to help people to live in the city as close to normal as possible? So um, if we look back um, in the history, like uh, Sach already uh, introduced, you can see that uh, the communicable disease and the city go hand in hand and the health concerns have always been influential in shaping the principle and the standard of urban planning and design. Um, modern planning, I would say, such as uh, building urban facility, urban infrastructure standard, like the redesign of the Thames, uh, Thames River of London, Central Park, um, the Emerald Necklace um, in Boston, and also uh, 
the garden city that Sach um, already showed us were the response to the cholera epidemic in the 19th century. In the response, uh, this response could be called the great uh, sanitary awakening character, uh, at the time characterized by the integration of the public health principle with the urban design, planning and engineering to guard against the future outbreaks. Over time, this new standard become institutionalized for large city in Europe and in North America. Um, similar to what happens now, we really should expect that uh, COVID as a new epidemic challenge will bring about again a meaningful and longer term change in addition to the measure to contain the immediate uh, crisis like, um, for example, like Bangkok is doing now. Um, for the COVID, um, let's uh, have a look how the city adapt in order to coexist with uh, this uh, threat of the communicable disease. Um, you can see uh, for two years, um, almost major cities around the world have implemented similar measures to prevent um, and contain the spread of COVID-19, such as um, social distancing, masking, vaccination, restriction of the movement, lockdown in the event of the outbreak, and the shift of work and school to the home by um, remote access. But not every city has the vision to look beyond um, immediate crisis management. This leads us to um, the very important question. If this pandemic continues to evolve, how should the city prepare so that the people can live safely and close to the normal as possible? So um, some cities um, like in Paris, um, in, um, where am I now? have taken the opportunity to exploit the COVID crisis to implement policies that um, would otherwise uh, would be very difficult to achieve under the normal circumstance, such as uh, resetting urban mobility and public space management. Um, in terms of the movement of the people, uh, you can see in the slide, uh, we have seen the return of the 15 minute city concept. This concept is not new. It's actually it's just since the early um, um, 20th century. Um, the essence is that uh, the t uh, within the temporal radius of 15 minutes or about uh, 1.5 uh, kilometers walking distance from the person's house, everyday utilities such as uh, shops, parks, school, etc., must be linked to the domicile by the quality foot and or bicycle paths, like um, the diagram. This is a diagram from, I think, uh, Anne Hidako uh, for her campaign for election. And, and I think uh, you see a lot of uh, change, especially on this, um, the, the bicycle paths is really uh, uh, de developed uh, extensively um, this year. I have interviewed my friend who's really a biker. Um, so, um, sorry, uh, in addition to the convenience, making the neighborhood uh, around the house walkable also help uh, support the local economy like you see here, especially during the period of the disease uh, outbreak. Uh, when people have uh, restrictions on travel outside the neighborhood, na they naturally uh, have to patronize uh, the shops and the services in the locality. Uh, this is a similar phenomena with the city that is the design for uh, walking and, and cycling. So um, in this uh, situation, Yan or neighborhood or subunit of the city have a very important function as a micro economies and that makes it easier for the disease control authority to con con uh, contain um, outbreaks to confine area. Other localities without the outbreak can continue also to function relatively normally as long as they practice masking, social distancing and no indoor um, crowding. Um, 
In addition to um, what I have said uh, about the 15-minute city, uh, it can be seen that during the urban spread of the airborne pathogen like uh, COVID-19, uh, longer trips are severely curtailed and the traffic volume of all types is decreased. The silver lining of this uh, slowdown is that uh, dust, smoke, and noise pollution due to the uh, road uh, traffic um, enormously decrease um, almost overnight. Even uh, when the mass transit uh, is uh, still operation, in uh, operation, uh, commuters tend to shun enclosed uh, conveyor of a group of people with or without masks. Uh, as a result, in many cities, there has been a boom in the use of a bicycle, a bike boom, and uh, individual transport like uh, a trottinette. Here you see a lot, um, electric uh, scooter. Um, I heard it's an enemy of a biker here. There was a report that in the response to the COVID pandemic, the cities have uh, const construct more than um, 2,000 kilometers of the new pedestrian and the bicycle path um, during the, the, the COVID uh, pandemic. As a result, it <clears throat> is that uh, many cities in Europe, uh, even in the North America, which is really a car-oriented uh, car, um, oriented uh, city, and also in Asia, have invested um, greatly in developing foot, uh, footpaths and uh, bike paths during the period of a modifying a COVID quarantine, um, encouraging city residents and visitors to use non-motorized and self-powered transport instead. So this is a, a kind of a, a, a big transformation that uh, you can observe and this transformation has um, an economic equivalent in the hundred of million of euros. So um, what is more, this movement has led to the trial of a car free and a slow, uh, slow street. Um, this is a this is uh, in, I think, the uh, Livoli uh, uh, Street uh, in Paris, and I couldn't believe that they can really take back uh, two lanes uh, of, uh, from car for the bicycle like uh, you see here. So uh, implement the car free and the sole street uh, to the incentive program. So for the urban uh, planners and designer I have talked with, uh, these emerging trends are really a golden opportunity to implement idea that would otherwise be very difficult to achieve under the normal circumstances, even in, in Paris. Um, like this, uh, you see everywhere um, in um, Paris now. Uh, this is uh, in Milan. So um, another issue um, is uh, about the public park, where uh, another very important issue. The COVID uh, epidemic has exposed the need for a more green public space as a zone for us uh, to relax, to play, to exercise, and to alleviate of a mental suffering from the isolation in the confined space. We must not forget that what may be even more frightening than being infected by COVID is the depression that comes from the stress and inactivity and related conditions such as uh, obesity, high uh, blood pressure, heart disease, uh, drug use, and domestic, domestic violence. However, the principle is that the public park must not be centralized Instead, they must be distributed um, ideally in every district so that people can access them by walking. So in summary, from uh, the COVID, COVID pandemic that has lasted for two years, uh, we can observe uh, many cities taking advantage for um, of uh, opportunity to advocate for the regenerate parts of the city to make it more accessible for, by food and by bicycle. This include making a public parks more accessible for people. Equitable uh, access like such uh, mentioned to amenities will help alleviate stress and promote a sense of uh, solidarity in the face of hardship. 
with people safely out and about, then a symbol of uh, normal life can be restored, along with the mutual benefit of fueling um, the local economy. So um, from the world to Thailand, how has the COVID pandemic exposed the risks to the big city like Bangkok? So just to introduce um, you all what happened here and assessment how Bangkok respond, um, capable uh, to respond to the, this uh, crisis. So um, you in Habitat, uh, some of you I think uh, have read this report already, has conducted the research with which uh, found that the access to healthcare services, including the efficiency and tam timeliness of the epidemic responses uh, measures is a very important factor effect affecting the number of COVID cases and deaths. Um, the global finding that I just mentioned is very consistent with the experience of managing the COVID crisis in Bangkok over the past years, especially during the third wave of the epidemic spread. I think Atan will uh, talk about uh, talk about this issue tomorrow. Um, however, I just would like to add a little bit a bit more here um, about uh, uh, the urban weak spot. Um, the, 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 the epidemic in Bangkok ha, had, has exposed a lot on this issue, the urban, urban, urban weak spots, sorry, this is very early here, urban weak spots of uh, fertility of uh, the city. In particular, you see here, this is uh, um, our study from UDC. UDDC. In particular, a uh, densely settled community with uh, lower income and marginalized residents have uh, inherent limitation in their ability to practice preventive hygiene and social distancing, like uh, the government suggests them to do. Factors have, may include the deterioration of the domicile and surrounding and unavoidable crowding in the main living quarters. The mass layoff of a minimum wage revelers, workers, and the closure of schools has meant that uh, more ma family members are at home during the day um, than they were before. Public health services um, to these uh, lower income communities is very limited. And the reliance on the cheapest food means uh, the nutrition of the families really suffers. Those workers who still have a job usually have to commute by the public transportation and that exposes them to the COVID infection without any viable alternative. This crowded and unsanitary conditions make them ripe for the for the next outbreak, which can be uh, sparked by only a single and silent infection. These communities are also ideal incubators of the variant strains of the COVID since many uh, may not be able to access to the um, vaccination. So um, multiple research study have uh, validated that uh, this dynamic in the era of the COVID and population vulnerability Another study in, uh, by you and Habitat uh, look at the relationship between the COVID infection rates and the Gini coefficient. I think you have seen that in the low to high income countries. The result uh, show that uh, the socioeconomic inequality uh, has had a huge exacerbating effects on the spread of COVID damaging and catalyzing the collapse of the health care system. Maybe tomorrow, Ajahn Tuida can really discuss on this. So in the case of Bangkok, uh, previous cluster of the outbreaks have of often occurred in the lower income communities or the worker housing compound, like uh, I show in this slide. Bangkok has, all, um, has over six uh, 600 lower income communities with a combined population around um, 600,000 uh, inhabitants. And there are at least um, uh, during the third wave um, 
in the last spring, uh, 400 workers camp in Bangkok with uh, approximately um, 62,000 uh, laborers who live in this uh, work site. So they are informal labor force that drive a major uh, sector of Bangkok economy. So it's very important lesson that uh, shouldn't be missed. Um, so we should call for a solution um, and improve the quality of life of this uh, urban weak spot. Um, I, I think uh, we also learned from Singapore um, even Singapore discovered to um, uh, that uh, the worker shelters uh, were the COVID uh, hotspots, but uh, the country that country uh, respond rapidly to boost the quality of life of this group of people. So, um, what are the specific issue in Bangkok that need to further attention in the wake of uh, this uh, COVID uh, epidemic? Um, I think that uh, the challenge in Bangkok should be in line with those uh, of other cities of uh, similar size and complexity. As mentioned before, uh, looking ahead, it is uh, almost a certainty that another epidemic or disaster will occur in, the, in our lifetime that requires people to isolate at home for undetermined period of time. In those uh, unpredictable conditions, part of the city will have to close, reopen and close again. What that means is that the radius of the travel, our travel, uh, potential for the average uh, residents in Bangkok will shrink. For example, every time uh, that uh, uh, the ed epidemic occur, the reach of the city developer will shrink to just uh, immediate neighborhood or yan. Therefore, a neighborhood needs to be redesigned to accommodate the layout of the residential um, environment so that people can self-quarantine while maintaining their physical and mental health. The goal should be a neighborhood that, um, that is uh, pleasant to live, uh, to, to live in around the clock uh, and have uh, enough uh, public utility for active living. This include a walkable and bikeable pathway, public parks, shops, market, public health services, this way, neighborhood become a micro, um, um, like um, uh, a small universe of the larger city uh, they reside in. Um, so, uh, from here, it just a few uh, slides about the situation uh, of Bangkok, um, assessed by uh, UDDC. Uh, the first is about uh, the access by a public park. Sash already uh, mentioned how important it is. So that said, uh, having enough uh, green space is uh, still a big challenge for Bangkok, even before the COVID epidemic. According to the study by UDDC, uh, there is uh, average about the seven square meters of the green space per, uh, per, per capita per uh, Bangkok residents. This is lower than um, the WHO minimum standard of uh, nine square meters per person. Importantly, those seven square meters are not all public parks either. Instead, the, the space include a various type of uh, green area such as inaccessible lengths of the foliage in the median of the multi-lane thoroughfares, like uh, in the middle of the street, uh, or the grassy plot uh, at the small intersection or the roundabout that you cannot really use it. Indeed, if the green area of Bangkok is calculated as a ratio to the daytime and nighttime population, as a, uh, for example, suburban commuters, then there is actually less than one square meter per person of the green space to enjoy. So which is uh, really um, um, a crisis. In addition to that, people's access to the park area overlaps. Um, in the central business district in Bangkok, uh, such as uh, Patumwan district, Silom and Saton district, 
there are many large parks like Lumpidi, Benjakiti, and many, many. In this area, people can access uh, to the park by foot. By contrast, there are um, other densely populated uh, district where um, no park at all in the vicinity of the residential area. To those districts, pedestrian access to the public park can be um, uh, almost impossible, like uh, more than 4.5 kilometers, like you see here. Uh, the green, like uh, the green firework, uh, is uh, represent uh, a walkable distance to the the closest park, the nearest park, like uh, um, shorter than um, 500 meters, and the red. Uh, firework is more than five kilometers. So um, imagine, uh, for example, in Prakanong area, which is uh, really one of the upcoming uh, residential area uh, now, um, total a total absence of the public park in the vicinity. So you can imagine if we have to live in, in the congested area with no green space to stroll around, when the part of the city um, are in a lockdown and people require to shelter in place, um, so such a lack of the access to uh, the outdoor has become like uh, claustrophobic and can have uh, at worst health consequences. Um, therefore, if the BMA advanced the policy to build more public park area, they should be distribute parks to our district throughout city rather than reinvest in enlarging the centrally located parks that already exist, such as like uh, BMA this year, they invest um, during the COVID crisis, they decide to invest 1 billion baht to upgrade uh, Lumpini Park, I told you in the in the Patumwan district where the proportion, the area of the green space is even um, um, among the highest uh, compared to other districts in Bangkok. So, and the park already in a good condition. And they should avoid also impractical ventures such as uh, the Klong Chong Nun Si Canal Park. This is uh, located just uh, very close to Christine's house, which is uh, located in the median of the four lanes thoroughfare and thus very difficult to access from the roadside. Um, this is uh, another 1 billion baht. So um, instead, if this budget was more equitably divided into densely populated area which lack park like Pakanong, I can name it like 30, uh, districts uh, in Bangkok, it would be, um, how to say, it, uh, we would have like uh, 60 to 70 million bahts per district. And that would be more than enough uh, to significantly improve the quality of life for millions of Bangkok residents and visitors throughout the, the Bangkok area. Um, so this is uh, Kutmo Pai Road has mentioned. This is uh, the project that support um, continuously supported by Thai Health Promotion Foundation, um, Walkable uh, Bangkok. Um, this uh, map, uh, yes, uh, shows uh, the green area. The green color is the area that you can live without car, because everything that you uh, need in life that I mentioned, amenities, shop, parks, uh, learning facility, located within the walk, walk, walking distance, 800 meters. So uh, if we take a look for the whole Bangkok, it's uh, only about 10%, which is very um, small proportion. It's not walkable at all in the suburb area. But if you look at the inner city area where um, the rail infrastructure heavily invested, so it's um, um, maybe share um, higher proportion, 60% of uh, inner city area is walkable. So um, COVID has forced us to really uh, uh, re uh, recognize the importance of uh, creating a good walk city environment. Um, the government has invested a lot in um, greatly in uh, of a public budget in the development of the mass rail transit system in Bangkok and vicinity. 
um, but those trains have still not solved um, the pedestrian challenge for the commuters who may live or work like um, kilometers from the nearest train station, so-called the first mile or last mile from home to work uh, and back um, still largely unwalkable. So um, even where they exist, the sidewalk, the pedestrian pathway are quite inconvenient, unsafe, and otherwise uninviting. So this is, I think, this is um, um, even more important than Chong Lun Si or um, like that project I showed to you. Therefore, um, the, ma the mass rail transit system must come with a change in the environment that support the urban lifestyle by walking, cycling, and strolling through the uh, pathway, which are convenient, uh, safe, and, and inviting to traverse. So this is the last point that I would like to share here. Another challenging issue in the formal education um, from the perspective as a teacher at university. So um, the COVID pandemic has forced students around the world to leave the classroom and study at home. The experience from teaching students through online channels since uh, last year um, has shown, um, how to say, uh, has shown that uh, the home learning has caused some students become overly stressed and at risk uh, of a clinical depression. Uh, but what should be raised here, um, another issue to raise here is that for the education culture in Thailand, the school age uh, youth should leave the house and spend eight hours in school with teachers since they were young until they, they graduate uh, high school. The ma majority of the city and national government investment in the formal education, therefore heavily focus on the school establishment and facility, not outside, not much on other learning facility outside school that support individual studies such as a public library, museum and public space like uh, in, in France, in Paris, you can have like um, 100 options uh, for uh, the children, for young people to, to go and learn by themselves. But uh, this is not the case in um, Thai uh, education culture investment. So when it shifted to online with eight hours, it became a nightmare for student, teacher, and parents. So um, it, 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 it is uh, possible to imagine, for example, a curriculum in which half uh, of the school day is in the classroom, while the other half is independent study through the use of existing source of uh, the learning in the city, like uh, just mentioned, public library, museum, and public space. This might help reduce the stress of having to sit for eight hours of lecture or in front of the the computer. So this vision could be um, the prevailing trend in the future of learning which uh, COVID has accelerated. In the Thai context, uh, such a change would entail a paradigm shift towards uh, learning instead of investing in the school building and also public and private partnerships uh, to promote learning area in the city. As you can see in the slide, um, this is a UDDC study of um, the learning facility in Bangkok. It was found that the area that promote learning outside school mm -hmm. are concentrated only in the central business district like Patum Wan, Bang Rak, Thunburi, Krong San. But uh, in other districts like in the Prairie Urban, this type of public learning, learning space are almost non-existence. So um, this example uh, reflects some of the growth um, in equality of Bangkok. The COVID crisis has given urban planners and administrators the opportunity to consider a new perspective on the living and learning and the need for the policy reset to achieve the vision. So um, 
sorry, this is the last slide. I would like to conclude with the observation that um, the, the city, of course, affect the well, well being of people and has more profound effect during the crisis, such as uh, um, COVID pandemic. Um, COVID-19 has shown the city that, uh, um, how to say, the city that are well designed and well planned can help communities and society cope better with the health crisis. In those cities, people can still have an active lifestyle and the urban economy can still continue to hum. By contrast, unequal access to basic public services exacerbate the spread of the disease and the worst case scenario can lead to the collapse of the health care system. So go back to the Thames River redesign. Two century ago, um, 19th century, the enlightened city leaders, manager, planner, designer, administrator, and doctors um, collaborated uh, and to turn um, the crisis of the Corella into an opportunity to reset the city for a more healthy future. Thailand's urban problems are likely to be um, very complex and long-standing and murky, like the bottom of the Thames River before the reform. Um, but if we miss out this opportunity to learn together and advocate for a more meaningful change for the city, then our future may remain full of risks and the potential damage from the pandemic in the future, maybe the pandemic X in the future could be maybe much more severe and longer than what we are all facing right now. So thank you very much. Thank you, Ha Dan Ramon. I actually have tremendous the multiple questions, but I will save that as well. Um, especially I might ask the question that is going to stir up the atmosphere a bit, much like if you are an expecting governor of Bangkok, what would your bike lane would look like? <laughs> So I might come back to you on that, Ajanira Mon. Okay, Kala. Uh, moving on to the next speaker that uh, last of today, but uh, I usually save the base for last. And um, uh, I, I suppose to call her doctor and doctor, Nitya Bhanupha. She is currently the executive director at the Institute of HIV Research and Innovation in Bangkok, Thailand. Uh, she also has obtained her degree from Netherlands. So to my belief and what I'm actually uh, familiar of, um, Netherlands is one of the city that actually, one of the country that can make the city um, very friendly and resilient and taking care of a community quite well. Um, her interest, of course, in this kind of populated um, area and concerning of those um, medical well-being. Uh, she has deep interest in the key population-led health services, which empower lay providers to design and co-deliver health service to their peers. So with all due respect, and I'm not going to waste any more time, uh, the floor is yours, Ka. Thank you very much, Ka Ajahn um, Tawida, for um, that very kind introduction. And, and um, I also would like to thank the organizer for inviting me to be part of this conference. Um, it is truly my great honor, and I have learned a lot already from um, all the previous um, speakers. So I promise Ajahn Tawida that I will take no more than 20 minutes <laughs> to finish um, this um, first round <laughs> of uh, presentation, Ka. Um, so um let's uh, see if i can move um, to the next slide yes um so i will go through this talk by reviewing phases of covid 19 pandemic in bangkok and then to um um, discuss key um, scenarios during each phase, um, as well as the key actions that the communities um, take uh, in responding or, or addressing um, each um, scenarios in the crisis, which I will call the community-led COVID-19 response. And then I will um, end by um, discussing uh, some lessons learned and ways forward. 
So for Thailand, the first case of COVID-19 uh, was reported in January um, 2020. And for the whole year, we all were made very familiar with this fear-based campaigns and with a blaming style of public communications. And every day we will um, be um, listening to um, this timeline of each newly diagnosed COVID-19 um, case, uh, which was shared officially and publicly. And um, sometimes without adequate protection of one's identity or uh, confidentiality information. And risk areas were pointed out by geography and by business types and people visiting these risk areas were all considered at risk, regardless of the protective measures um, used by each individual. And um, therefore, it is not surprising to see the success of these fear-based communications in generating and perpetuating stigma and discrimination towards um, individuals with COVID-19 and their families. Um, all COVID-19 cases in Thailand were required to be hospitalized and be cared for by um, healthcare professionals in full uh, PPE gowns. And individuals recovered from COVID-19 couldn't return home and faced um, community rejection. Some lost their jobs. Um, some of their family members were forced to quarantine regardless of the level of contact with the case or um, the level of protection used by uh, these family uh, members in the same household. And worse consequences uh, would come in the following year. And the third wave of COVID-19 um, in Bangkok um, started in April 2021, so this year. This year, um, all COVID-19 cases were still requested to be hospitalized and efforts were made to rapidly increase the number of um, hospital beds and in huge amounts of resources uh, were invested in establishing hospitals and field hospitals. Um, COVID-19 cases were still not allowed to receive care at home, but were forced to wait at home for hospital beds. And with more and more cases, these hospitals, field hospitals and hospitals also became more and more selective in admitting COVID-19 cases, not in a way that the more um, severe cases were admitted first, but on the contrary, these severe cases were admitted last um, by um, these hospitals and hospitals. So here in April 2021, the community-led COVID-19 responses, or uh, in short, COM COVID-19, um, started with the leaders of urban poor communities um, led by the Human Settlement Foundation and many other NGOs like um, Access, um, Swing, um, Foundation for AIDS um, Rights, um, and Rainbow Sky Association of Thailand realized the urgent need for communities to help themselves um, to um, go through through um, this um, crisis. And IHRI, my own organization, uh, because we have a small clinic with a few doctors and nurses, um, were um, tasked to provide clinical support to this troop. And um, um, as part of this come COVID-19, a client-centered and holistic service delivery model was co-designed and then co-delivered um, both virtually and in person by healthcare professionals together uh, with community lay providers. And the aim is to provide the best basic clinical assessment and support to provide um, livelihood support and also to um, provide supports on mental health stigma and human rights violation Why the people in the communities uh, were still waiting for hospital beds. And in April to May 2021, um, why people were dying at home, access to large quotas of COVID-19 vaccines were still kept for prioritized groups of people like those in transportation and education sectors. Um, and the ownership of these vaccine quotas uh, was very strong, um, especially um, to the level that if anyone outside of the group, like these community leaders who were caring for their uh, community members um, who dare to come and ask for vaccine, would be treated like a thief. And um, for healthcare uh, workers, healthcare providers who were not working in the hospitals, but were giving um, care in the communities um, to get the vaccine, we would need to beg around or to trade um, by volunteering in this um, vaccination center. 
And um, the consequences of stigma and discrimination that uh, were so successfully created over the past year uh, came uh, clear as people um, were forced to leave their house, people with uh, COVID-19 were forced to leave their house and died on the street. And many people would choose not to be tested just to um, avoid um, potential discrimination by community and workplace in, in, in case that they uh, were tested positive. And migrant workers um, stateless person, asylum seekers suffered another layer of discriminative actions by service providers um, due to the lack of government's um, clear and official um, commitment to reimburse the cost of COVID-19 testing and COVID treatment um, to these providers. So in July um, 2021, ComCovid was requested by our um, body uh, that pay for service, um, um, clinical services, uh, which is the National Health Security Office or NHSO, to expand its scope to um, provide quality COVID-19 care at home or in community for majority of COVID-19 cases who had uh, no to mild uh, symptoms and why the government was trying to free up their hospital beds and this is um, uh, so-called the home isolation or community isolation um, in Thailand. But it took quite a few weeks uh, for us to advocate and demonstrate communities' capacity in order to convince the Department of Medical Services to allow us to bring the first line COVID-19 drug um, favipiravir out of the hospital to people at their home in the community. Um, but COVID, come COVID-19 um, has turned out to be country's uh, most comprehensive community-led COVID-19 service delivery models, uh, which included not only the immediate delivery of drugs and meals to cases with COVID-19, but uh, uh, community-led providers uh, also provided skill building for family members uh, who care for cases at home, and also to perform risk screening and targeted ATK testing for contacts at home and in the community. And all of these services were conducted by community lay providers in close collaboration and with a virtual support by doctors from the Royal College of Family Physicians uh, of Thailand. But um, care at home was not always possible, um, especially in household where you have elderly people or you have people who are at risk of developing um, severe um, COVID-19 diseases if uh, contracted um, um, the virus. So um, there are various community-led community isolation or community-led CI models uh, established uh, by, by uh, the leadership of uh, each community based on their local context with an aim just to simply give a shared living space in the community where care and support can be closely provided by uh, community-led providers. And therefore, settings of this community-led CI can be an empty house for rent or can be a section of um, accommodation space um, in a construction camp or in a factory. Um, however, um, this community-led CI uh, model might not meet the standards um, set by some experts. And from time to time, these standards were used by some governmental bodies uh, to act against uh, the establishment of community uh, isolation settings, uh, which is the community-led uh, one. And I uh, really admire our community leader uh, colleagues um, for their um, perseverance, uh, their humility, and their ability to forgive uh, with the only goal to ensure that they can um, um, bring their communities to uh, survive um, this crisis. So um, from July to November um, this year, the COM COVID-19 together with the Royal College of Family Physicians of Thailand um, have pro uh, brought COVID-19 care to almost 30,000 uh, people with almost 10% of them being non-Thai. And um, this is truly um, a, a, a real partnership um, among the partners uh, listed um, here, who together have brought in like thousands of um, volunteers from various disciplines. And each of them has contributed very significantly to this concerted effort to um, respond to COVID-19 crisis in Bangkok. And it does not stop in Bangkok because um, the um, this troop has already extended their community-led 
expertise um, to um, various um, provinces with high COVID-19 burden in the country, including those uh, those in uh, the north and uh, those uh, in the deep south. So now I would like to summarize lessons learned. And the first lesson uh, is that trust in community-led health responses didn't come without an investment. We have demonstrated that urban communities can be rapidly empowered to deliver responses to reduce COVID-19 uh, transmission, morbidity, and mortality. But investment has to be taken seriously um, for the community empowerment and the investment, this investment in community empowerment needs to be funded. Um, and and um, with the seriousness uh, that we um, take, the COVID-19 knowledge uh, could be quickly um, translated into a series of fact-based and practical skill building sessions, as you can see uh, in the pictures um, here. Community, teaching community um, has been the most efficient way um, in capacity building. And the second lesson uh, learned is that we, um, need to urgently address a severe lack of primary health care mindsets among our policymakers and among our health care uh, professionals in general. And um, we can see that uh, to con convincing authorities and convincing um, professional councils to accept and endorse the leadership and roles of communities have been challenging. Um, for HIV, um, we have been um, uh, taking like half a decade to achieve um, this. And, and you can see that um, among um, the NGO partners um, that have come together um, to um, provide cares under the COM COVID-19, um, it, it, is, it is not just a chance that we uh, come together. It actually, um, that um, we have all been working in HIV field with an aim to end HIV um, in the next uh, nine years. And we have been doing this um, together for uh, more than three decades. Um, and uh, during the last decade, we have been uh, very successful in bringing the community-led response uh, for HIV to boost up the number, the, the coverage of the uptake of HIV testing, HIV treatment, and HIV prevention in the country. Um, and um, so, so um, what I'm trying to say here is that um, although convincing authorities and professional councils could be very um, challenging, it could be achievable as well. And for, for uh, the COVID-19, uh, we can say uh, that full support from the MOPH and NHSO has been instrumental in the success of community-led COVID-19 uh, responses in Bangkok. And the last lesson uh, learned is that we really need a collaborative effort to sustain the community-led healthcare as part of the primary healthcare system in our country. And this is for us to be ready for the next crisis and as well as to optimize responses to other ongoing public health threats. And this can be done through countries institutionalization to put community-led healthcare as part of the guidelines, the national guidelines, to put this as part of professional guidelines and to ensure that service cost reimbursement from the government can um, go to the community directly. And as already mentioned um, earlier, it is beyond money. It is about changing the mindsets of um, policymakers, of the government, and, and, and especially uh, of the healthcare professionals. And there are three um, principles that guide a successful um, community-led health responses um, to make sure that we know which clinical roles um, can be demedicalized um, to lay providers and, and can be task shifted to um, people in the communities and to individuals um, themselves. And also to know uh, which clinical steps can be simplified or can even be removed. And lastly, to understand um, which uh, individuals need more intensive or less intensive care so that we can um, differentiate our limited resources accordingly. 
And I would like to end by uh, concluding that country and cities must learn from COVID-19 responses that centralization and paternalism can harm urban healthcare system. And we have demonstrated that individuals and communities can be empowered rapidly to be responsible for own health through um, simplification, demedicalization, and differentiation of health services. Um, and that community-led primary health care system has huge potential as an efficient um, service delivery model for other health conditions, especially those with high um, stigma um, in urban settings uh, in Thailand. Um, but we will need adequate and continuous investment um, to sustain and scale up these community-led health responses. And therefore, um, strong advocacy is needed to get sincere um, policy commitment. I'd like to acknowledge uh, all um, our partners listed on this um, slide. And thank you very much uh, for uh, listening. Thank you, Kha. I um, do actually share uh, the same kind of, um, I don't know what to call it, intention or, or lesson learned that, um, and this is the first time I, I, I saw the terminology of demedicalized, because usually, usually in, in political science, we kind of support decentralization. And basically the the happening, the event of cheering up those um, health volunteer or so more. In, in Thailand, usually people commend them for their dedication and sacrifice. But to me, it's not just that. To me, is this is the real decentralization of health system. And, and we seem to overstep talking about this instead of um, just cheering up that, oh, we are kind. That's a cliche. And um, because, but most of the time we've been questioning because decentralization is either a medical way or in, in disaster. Um, if the other end, the locality and the local authority, if they are not competent or if they are not at their full potential, that can end up with the impact of life and death. Mm -hmm. So basically we're questioning if they are capable enough to be decentralized. And then oh. I've been wondering, if mm. the medical thing can be de-medicalized and make it easier, simplify and full support of the resource. And then it can create a more closer, friendlier and faster kind of healthcare mm. that is trustable too. So mm. thank you for that idea. I might come back to you with my question regarding so this thank you. And demedicalization. Um, okay. Now we are coming to the second round and to let the, um, my, my, my last speaker, Ajahn Tia, can get some rest and uh, Ajahn Niramon is running for some juice, I guess. So let's go to second round. Um, MC Ka, my lovely MC or organizer, have we had any kind of um, pop-up question from the audience or should I shoot each of the speaker with my gun. Um. <laughs> and then you might okay, start I'm gonna with your them question then. first. And okay. um, there are some audience who want to ask. Now, oh. um, Kundi J. Clario, he raised his hand. Yes, thank you. Okay, uh, thank you for the opportunities, uh, actually. Uh, personal, I'm fully agree to Ms. Vivi and Mr. Ruku for the research findings. Uh, nowadays, Indonesia is suffered by blood and seawater level rise. Here are caused by climate change impact. So my question is, what do you think about housing and settlements development partner? Uh, yeah, yes, after, and so on in today, if we correlate uh, the sector development to climate disaster reductions initiatives. Thank you. Uh, we we can can you hear the question well? I, I lost the last part. Yeah. Yeah, me, yeah. me too. So I'm, I'm I thought that it's only me. Um, DJ, would you mind? Um, perhaps the the connection is not very very efficient at that point. Can you repeat your question one more time? Yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, I would repeat my question. Uh, my question is, what do you think about housing and settlements development control? 
in Indonesia for green space, infrastructure, and so on. Uh, if we correlate those development sector to climate disaster reduction initiatives. Thank you. Is clear enough? I think so, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, um, should I get two more questions first so that I can turn to the speakers? MC, do I have any other hands? Wait a minute, Ka Jan. Um, that's okay, Ka. Oh, there is a question in the chat box. So, um, this it's the question to all: How do you work with, and how can you be hard? by both central and local government to improve health condition in cities? Okay, that's a good question to I share some of the interest of the answer to. Um, so let's let's go to the question of DJ first. Um, Wiwi and Ruku, can you respond to the question first? Yeah, thank you. Uh, maybe I would like to start and maybe later on uh, Pak Ruku will add several points. And thank you, Rio, for raising the, the questions. Um, of course, yeah, I think it has been happening uh, in many uh, cities in most probably in Asia. There are a lot of um, mm -hmm. cities, uh, coastal cities issues related to the housing settlement and also related to main infra infrastructural work. And the problem is that related to the health and urban planning issues, most of the this kind of issues uh, is addressed by kind of engineering uh, and construction work. We are likely to build road and to maintaining all the settlement located along the coast. While actually it will, uh, it may not solve the, the problem of the coastal area for a long term. And as the result, we invest more and more in a kind of mini infrastructural coastal work to maintain this housing settlement and infrastructural condition along the coast. That's what I can say. What should we do? Uh, in general, there are two options for us, right? We maintain them we let uh, the settlement and housing along the coast and try to maintain keep them from many other many housing uh, many issues yeah disaster issues by for example uh maintaining the road uh, to ensure that they are not get flooded flooded and so on or we need to have a kind of a plan to re relocate relocate them to uh, somewhere else, uh, slowly, gradually, to ensure that uh, nobody will will get uh, into the right, uh, the high risk, uh, high exposure because of uh, a lot of coastal uh, disaster related issues. But uh, yeah, I'm not so sure whether uh, I'm addressing your your question directly, but that I can tell you in general when we can we when we see the development um, that quite massive, yeah, very massive that happening uh, along the coast uh, or in many dances uh, housing and settlement along the coast in 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 especially in Java Island in Indonesia. Please, Pak Ruku, maybe you would like to to add something. Yeah. Yes. Uh, thank you, Bui. Thank you uh, for the questions. Uh, maybe I would like to answer to the, to the question as well as to address question in the chat uh, from Christine. Uh, uh, the question is, uh, how do you work with and how can you be heard by both central and local government to improve health condition in cities? Uh, I think uh, I would like to uh, answer this question that may also address the first question is I think that 
how we work, I think, is different depend, depend on our uh, focus, on our discipline, because we know that health influencing factors is quite complex. It's not determined by one or two aspects, but it's uh, quite broad. So uh, I think we need to work based on our disciplines. Uh, for example, uh, there are many avenues to, to promote healthier cities. Uh, if we are engineers, maybe we work differently with uh, if we are ecologists or maybe if we are, say, uh, planners, it's quite different. So I think we can uh, work depend on our uh, disciplines. For example, from our case study, I think uh, at the central government, I think we need to review the procedure of uh, operational standard in developments of say public uh, vertical housing as well as designs in a, a human settlement. And then uh, at the local government, I think uh, everything is set up by the central government and then uh, local government has no capability to maintain. I think the local government to allocate funding, for example, to the investment in that area. So it guarantee that people will remain uh, in the health condition, in a healthier, uh, in health, uh, say a state of uh, life uh, in their uh, settlement and then uh, basically in any discipline that we can work uh, then we need to amplify our work through um, uh, uh, amplify with uh, like a social media or maybe with a uh, like a popular media so we can be heard uh, widespread the governments either at the local government or central government i think it is Oh, uh, one, one, one answer for Christine. So uh, maybe uh, that is, I will stop here and then maybe add uh, in for the discussion. Thank you. But that question is actually, I have to extend that question to the rest of the speakers too. But let me move from Indonesia to Bangkok and Thailand first. And then I ended, and it's up with the, how, how this question do with the, French kind of way. Um, I, you've been asked this question from me like several webinar and stage we were together. How would you end the war in my own word? How would you actually work in between this um, central government, national government, city government? Actually, Bangkok is particularly a picture of a country as well. Bangkok kind of have central Bangkok kind of administration and then the district level as a local way. How you work with them and perhaps make them cooperate, win them kind of thing? Your turn. You, you want like uh, the answer in theory or in <laughs> reality? No, I don't want anything in theory at this point. Just- Yes, actually down. I share my heart with uh, Professor Ruku. <laughs> um, actually, as Antawida, you, you know it all. <laughs> you, you know it all. And I learn a lot from you. Um, for, for French uh, colleagues, uh, Antawida is, um, is a main figure of uh, public administration in, in this country. Um, I think, as you said, um, there are really visionary and really serious uh, pol politicians and officer in every city. Um, the question is, uh, where are they? And if you found them, you are really lucky. And you, you, need, you really have to be able to work with them. And that you mentioned that I was lucky that I found the officer uh, to work with that uh, that, um, how to say, help us to implement uh, the, the public space, uh, uh, Sky Park. I think I gave the credit a lot to the officer in BMA. Um, but um, if you don't uh, find them, you, if, you don't, if you're not lucky in some city, sometimes you cannot find them, you cannot find that people. I think uh, just like uh, Professor Ruku said, uh, if uh, people, social media, media talk a lot about your project, about your idea, supported by uh, people, a lot of people, I think it helps because um, 
in the normal time, these people care about their waters. So if uh, this is the thing that their waters uh, share a lot, I, I think uh, they will call you and ask you to give the presentation. It happens too. Hmm. So in this case, you really need to invest in working with uh, people. Um, engage them, consult them, like uh, I'm so impressed by your work and everything <laughs> that you present to us. I, I think it's very important. And I think, um, yes, sir, urban uh, planning and design is really um, demanding and um, need um, seriousness. You need to really invest uh, time and energy to work with people, yeah. So this is uh, my, my, my answer. Thank you. Thank you, Ka, Ajahn Niramon. Ajahn Nitya, Ka, send some still in Thailand. Um, <laughs> um, here, here's, I'm, I'm gonna twist the question to you a little from the question of um, how you deal with those central and local, but working as a medical doctor and working for the Institute that has a lot of think tank kind of thing. I myself believe that you have a little bit more privilege to deal with these people according to the health kind of thing. So is it true that the knowledge, the technical kind of uh, skill or anything else make them trust you more <laughs> and make them listen to you more? Um, those politicians, government, and make you, make you, a person who can say final word at some point and then let you deal with both the local and central easier. Is it true? Mm. I thank you very much, as uh, I I I feel that it's probably uh, on the opposite way because. <laughs> Um, usually being a medical doctor and if you are just um, um, saying something as a doctor, people will listen to you. You will get that um, authority of um, being listened as uh, someone who can provide uh, medical advice. Uh, but since I, I mean, I, I, I always uh, see um, our institution, um, not really as a research institution, but more of an NGO. So that that kind of like um, sometimes um, um, weaken the message, the medical um, uh, the medical technical advice uh, message that um, the government, the local, the central one um, <laughs> want to hear. You know, um, but but I, I think um, um, the way um, to go uh, for us, I I still feel that um, um, we we do not need to like. Um, be strong on just one side. We can we can be strong on both sides. Uh, being a researcher, you are strong uh, in um, data uh, uh, generating data, uh, at, as well as um, being on the advocacy side. You can use your uh, credit um, to advocate for the data that you generated. That's one thing. But I don't think that um, by being a, a medical doctor and having a research institution um, has played that major role. I, I have to admit that it's um, mainly because of the collaborations that we have uh, with the community-based organization um, and with um, those really uh, working on the ground. Um, and I, I, I'm a person I'm, which um, I mean, I'm, I'm a person that uh, truly believe that um, if you are talking about community engagement, you need to do that seriously. And, and we are like so used to just having a community representative be a token in, in, in any um, meeting, uh, which, which I think like it's so out of date and we need to change that culture. Um, so by engaged community, you then create a champion in the community who will then um, do the advocacy um, roles in which you cannot do that because you are not the member of the communities uh, to say that to the um, authorities. Thank you, Hajan. I truly agree, Hajan, because um, to make the real engagement, that's a hard work. To make an image of engagement, that's an easy one. That's why they actually love to do that uh, a lot. And the power of knowledge sometimes cannot win the power of power. Uh, and that's that's still a problem. Okay, uh, to this question as well, uh, 
Dr. Moran, it's your turn of shining to us if there is some way better that we have to learn in terms of dealing with these several levels of government. Thank you very much. And I'm uh, very impressed by, your, by, 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 by the panel here today. So I learned a lot of, from uh, all of you. Huh? Thank you very much. And thank you, uh, Ajanta Vida. Sure, I have to visit you. Huh? To, uh, to, to learn also from you after at Tamasat University. Uh, I, I have to say that uh, we, ca we can work at, at two levels. Uh, the first level is, a, is, is quite a global level to, to better understand. And uh, I'm, I'm very also very interested in what we learn from Indonesia, what we learn from Bangkok, what we can learn from other cities. Uh, it's important. And in this case, and I would just to share with you that we, I did not present this, but normally we will have a, a project accepted between the Singapore government and the CNRS, the CNRS, and uh, this project will be on the sustainable cities and is also to improve the prediction of epidemics uh, in, uh, in Singapore and uh, by developing mostly uh, risk assessment, uh, modeling, uh, epidemiological modeling, and, uh, and uh, finally to support uh, better uh, the, to improve the prevention, uh, but also to, to better support uh, uh, policy making in planning and design. So we will just launch next year, beginning of the next year, this project. So I hope that we can face to face continue to discuss about this on this project. But because what, what we learned today from, from you that big, the cities are facing many things, many problems, climate change, Energy, we did not discuss about energy, but the, the rise of energy demands, especially facing climate change. Flooding, we, uh, we, we see that in, in Indonesia. Air pollution, we will, we will see that tomorrow. Problem of water also, quality of water. All of these affect finally two kinds of things in the, in, the, in the health. The infectious disease, we see that with dinghy, but with diarrhea, with other disease, and non-communicable disease that are rising because of the changing of uh, diet, more to the westernized and processed food the diet, which is completely related to the rise of diabetes and all of the problem of uh, autoimmune disease. So the burden will be uh, very high in both ways. And in changing also because the urban cities starting to have uh, older people and less children. So also this is something that is uh, to, be, to be planned to be this. So it's one side. I think the science can work very well. And we have many examples today uh, to show that with map, with data, with gathering, so and improve uh, finally the, the, the science that need to the policy makers, to the, to the governors of cities. And the other side is to way to work uh, finally more locally and more concretely sometimes. I have no experience uh, in cities, I have to say, even if I'm, I grew up in cities uh, in, uh, in France, but I, I have 10 years of, uh, of working with local communities in Northern Thailand, uh, in Tawang Pa actually, uh, and in a sub-district. So working with eight villages, we conduct a, a lot of, uh, of work and I will go, uh, Saturday, I go again for two weeks of work with them with a spillover uh, uh, of coronavirus uh, between uh, dogs, rodents, wildlife, and of course, bats and humans. And thanks because I'm, I'm good guy from biodiversity, I told you, and ecology, but we work directly with the primary care unit, directly with the district hospital, because we, this is the way that you can really reach uh, the, the community. And uh, Dr. Nitaya, you show us this is this, but also our colleague from uh, Indonesia directly show this, and uh, actually Ajani Ramon also present this. So this is the way uh, to go. Even for me, I was more interesting at saving the species, saving the biodiversity, than saving humans at the very beginning. But finally, working on the health of humans, I found humans quite interesting animals, uh, interesting uh, thing not so cute as my uh, favorite animals. I work on rodents and rats, but uh, okay, it's okay. They are, they are nice, but they are nice people. So, and this is, we can work on this. And I think that after 10 years, I see much more, uh, much more of this we can do. And this is also an, a new way because I'm, 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 I tell you, I'm the guy from the ecology, from biodiversity and for health. And all the time we are giving, uh, 
bad news, bad news about climate change, bad news about biodiversity crisis, bad news about health. We need to, to develop some projects that are more enjoyable, even for us as a scientist. And uh, that's why I, I want to switch. And even we can work some project in, in big cities. Or, and I think it's with uh, here with Ajani Ramon, I was very uh, amazed and impressed by this because it's a way to go. So the way to go to the, and I think that for our side, we can propose these kinds of nature-based solution. And the nature-based solution has to be promoted and it will be a, a, a win-win strategy. Nature-based solution that can improve the well-being and the health of the local people while favoring nature and biodiversity, while favoring climate, climate change. And this way to introduce the nature-based solution should be by the community, should be by the, the, the local. When Ajahn Niramon proposed that, okay, stop this big infrastructure, but starting to think at local uh, planning, urban plan, it will be small but it will be effective and will be repeatable. Of course, we need to have a lot of things and it will be enjoyable to work for this. Lot of uh, fun as a scientist also, we need to be this. And uh, I think we, we can really, we have to think how to do this and especially uh, with a good network of, uh, of, uh, of people and thanks for IRASEC to join us all together today. Thank you very much. And um, if um, this time, if I don't have any more of the question from the audience, um, I'm actually have some questions to each of the speakers. And it's kind of, it's gonna look like playing roulette with me. So I'm gonna show the question to you. Uh, for those of you who have my question, you actually have to respond, of course. It will be very spacious for my um, Thai speaker. I'm going to shoot multiple bullets to you, and you can choose not to answer some of my bullets. That's fine. But to my international speaker, you are by by my route to answer the question I'm going to ask. I'm going to actually start the question to Vivi and Ruku first, so that um, my beloved um, Dr. Mora can take some rest first. Um, Vivi and Kuru, I have two questions. Either of you can actually share the question, or if the rest of the speakers want to add something, um, wait till your turn too. Um, I have two questions. According to your presentation and, and from what I understand about both Indonesia and a lot of developing country kind of city and locals. First question is, usually coastal hazards are too many. The coastal area has a lot of multiple hazards. And some of these hazards are compound in its own. And also they have an evil twin, which means that you have a opposite effect from one another, drought, flood kind of thing. So you have a lot of diverse needs as well. So my question is, how can we choose or balance them between flood and pandemic or between hot air and then storm, between tsunami, earthquake, or um, infectious disease or clean air. So how would we balance or choose them among the other? You cannot give me the answer of choose both. No, you have to pick one. Uh, second question, resilience policy in developing countries is usually top down. It's usually making decision from up there. However, even if we pay attention to bottom up, or community engagement and participation. Those urban poor usually prioritize their economic status, their living, their earning, much more than the purpose of resilience and safety. So it would actually give somehow an, exempt, an exception to the policy maker. Ah, oh, the urban poor, they would not care. They only care about money. They only care about their earning and living. So let's just not do resilience. How would we do this? How would we make resilience on the table of policymakers? Your turn. <laughs> I'm you sorry. Really, <laughs> you really give yeah. us a I, I think it, good questions. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think it's a question for someone in the, like, like you, Dr. Tavida, as a political scientist. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. 
you. That's what I usually believe in trans discipline. I want someone else to answer this kind of thing, how, how they see things. <laughs> Dr. Vivi actually knows. She, she actually heard this question from me before. <laughs> Yeah, hard question. Yeah. So anyway, uh, Baroku, you would like to start or? Uh, I think uh, I think you is better to leave me. <laughs> okay. Um. Yeah. Then. Uh. Thank you for the interesting questions. Yeah. It's. Uh. To be very honest, it's really most of the times also pop up in my mind. Um. For most of the time, we all know uh, we cannot choose. Yeah, we cannot choose. But in the reality, we need to prioritize something to address some issues, right? We cannot solve all problem at the same time. That's the real condition that most of the time uh, we face. Uh, but for for my perspective, yeah, we we need to to see that not as uh, incremental uh, or partial issues. But I prefer to see it as a systematic uh, uh, problems. When we talk about drug, automatically uh, in the system perspective, we also talk about flood. When uh, in the end of the day, when we talk about uh, let's say climate-related disaster, we talk about the problem related with the water cycles. So I prefer to see all the problems as a systematic approach rather than we just focus on one uh, particular uh, disturbance, for example, and then resulted into a kind of maybe ignorance of other problems. But at the implementation level, at the operationalize, uh, in the oper uh, operationalization level, at the certain point of view, we need to prioritize something, of course, yeah. And of course, in every region, they also have kind of higher high risk of particular issues compared to other. For example, as in some area, maybe drought becomes a more important issues rather than flood. In other uh, areas, uh, the situation will be different. But despite that kind of situation, uh, which means we need to understand uh, the, this, uh, the area, but the bottom line is please see it as the uh, systematic uh, view. Then we need to see the, the, that one issues might relate it to other, uh, let's say, uh, coastal disaster uh, problems. That might be what I'm thinking actually when I'm listening your questions. And related to the second one, yeah, um, maybe I might not directly answer your questions, but uh, what I have in my mind at the moment is uh, it's really, I would like to promote the terms of resilience from below. What I believe is that when we talk about resilience, actually what we need to do to promote the resiliency is the people. So there is no reason to say that uh, don't make the, the resilience as a only a kind of political jargon, but let's see it as the real problem at the ground. And uh, please, uh, and we need to, to change the paradigm uh, in the sense that when we talk about resilience, it means maybe we need to focus on a kind of uh, community uh, empowerment process, things like that, because by doing that, we may have a more longer and transformative approach of resilience rather than only acting a kind of reactive uh, initiative yeah, to address kind of problems. Like I've mentioned earlier, when we have flood, uh, when we have flood problem, then we, we do uh, river normalization. But I think it it does uh, it is not really solve the, the the real issues when we do not also uh, makes do something for the people living in the flat area, something like that. Maybe I will stop here and maybe like Paruku, maybe you have a uh, yes. yeah, different opinion, please. <laughs> well, uh, just add uh, what uh, already mentioned by Guiwi, that I think in Indonesia case, uh, all of the decision is mainly guided by a uh, local development uh, mechanism, local development plan, which is already plans uh, at the um, five years uh, times is on mid medium time, medium term, and then is translated into uh, annual planning program. So I think it is uh, what is happened uh, where we decided uh, how we decide uh, our priority is already set. 
uh, it is based on the regulation but at the same time sometimes we uh, we expect that we can do at the spatial level or location based i think we solve that the issue based on uh, location by location because in location by location we can work uh, intersectoral and uh, multidisciplinary i think it is one idea which sometimes is not really really match or uh, fit uh, what is planned and what we, uh, we we are expected so that that is sometimes the the issue uh, it's not really uh, it's, it's, uh, there's no connection between the plan and what we need to do sometimes it's the problem something like that the, the, and then for your second questions uh, I would like to say that uh, policymaker is not is sometimes is uh, rational, basically. So uh, I think they also consider uh, people at the bottom of the pyramid, uh, because uh, if they uh, neglected them, I think it's also not good for the policymaker. So I think to bring that uh, we need to improve capacity and increase resilience of people at the bottom of the pyramid is also important. And then. Maybe we, as a scientist, we have to make sure the policymaker that what you will what 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 you will gain if you consider that one. I think the idea of co-benefits is also important. If you deal with this one, you get another benefit. What we mean as a co-benefit. Uh, if you deal with this uh, situation, uh, dealing with uh, improving this, uh, for example, uh, restoring the ecosystem in this. Uh, area to promote health, you will get, for example, area for tourism that will increase uh, income for the city. So I think we need to creatively uh, frame our, our our point of view uh, with a rationalistic and the way policymaker thinks about their interests, something like that. Thank you very much. I know I raised a very difficult question question yet you guys pull through so um that's a good answer too uh, uh actually i have two questions to you but i can make it one <laughs> <laughs> or, or you can <laughs> have, uh, digest digest is anyway um you know when you when you present and you pointing out of home isolation and community isolation one way to be honest, um, I share the same idea as when Dr. Moran is talking about bad news. I actually like bad news. I'm, I'm, I'm a disaster person. So what do you expect? I like bad news because bad news helped me make radical change. That, that, that's what I actually believe too. So when we bring in home isolation and community isolation from Korea, from Japan, actually we forgot to go back and re-examine us, whether or not we really be able to do home isolation. Because home isolation, as of what Ajahn Neuromon is actually study, is really impossible, almost impossible, even in Bangkok with prompt tech and preparation. So if I make you a prime minister tomorrow, <laughs> you're gonna be my prime minister tomorrow for a day and you have a magic wedge what would be the most important the most significant the first step or even the most difficult thing that you would use this magic to make thailand both at the mega city urbanization also at the local level have a capacity to take care of themselves to do home isolation or even community isolation what would be the first step medically fine so please go with it yeah, um, that's that's a very good um, question and 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 uh, maybe something of my dream because like over these past two years I always imagine if I was a prime minister what would I do in responding to to uh, this crisis. Um, so I think that what is really lacking in 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 the Thai um, society is the belief in um, empowering um, people. You know, and 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 it's it's really the belief um, that that um, um, keep us away from even think about um, how we can empower people, um, and we we just like stop um, at the first place that oh Thai people cannot be empowered. So that's the end of the story. So so I I I believe that. Um, if you uh, can like um, 
you have the power to um, make sure that the authorities, um, the institutions um, that usually uh, um, not be willing to um, be part of empowering people and not only that not be part of not willing to be part of sometimes uh, uh, act as a barrier to empower people um, see this as a as a um, 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 key um, um, issue uh, at the country level, then I think uh, things can move forward uh, because it's not that we are we will need to start uh, from zero. There are already many strong um, uh, communities, uh, many strong um, 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 NGOs and community-based organizations. So when 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 are, we are saying about communities here, like government um, usually are very afraid of um, communities um, in a way that it's. Um, externally funded um, NGO or something like that but but we we have local communities uh, which are strong um so so when I um, if I, I I can make this happen for things to move forward I think that it's not only the trust in um, empowering people uh, make sure that people uh, have the the capacity to be informed and then make decision by themselves. Yeah. Um, and and so so that's the, the 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 first part. The trust trust is not enough. You need to invest um, in um, making your trust uh, be um, um, reality as well. And that investment will need to be sustained. So so I think trust is needed as as the first step. And then you think you need to think about how to invest um, wisely and then to sustain um, that investment. And this I think um, um, we can uh, do it. We are a good communications. Um, um, Dr. Ruku talk about um, social uh, media communications. I, I think that's what is lacking uh, uh, from many governments. <laughs> um, they they want just to say like good things, um, and 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 they. Uh, believe that people will believe good things without questioning. Uh, but I think there is an art of communications in a way that you can say bad things, uh, you can say good things, and then you let people be informed and make a decision uh, by themselves. So that may address um, your first question to um, Dr. Viwandari and, and Dr. Ruku as well. Like we don't have to choose in between. <laughs> you, you, you can have way to communicate um, wisely. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ka Zhan. You make me really want to have new prime minister tomorrow. Um, so basically, <laughs> I'm sorry. I actually mistaking about time. I thought we have until um, 5.30, so we only have until about 5.10. So Dr. Moran, I'm going to be quick on you. I'm going to like shoot you into your heart. Um, addressing diversity, trying to speak with stakeholders, empathize everyone and make it integrative into this one health kind of resiliency or urbanization is a long due process for sure. I, I believe in that. Um, the data has to be very integrated. Is there any speedy step, anything at all that we can perhaps use it as a stimulus or anything to make it just jump a bit? So that we, because I believe that disruption now so that you cannot just go slow. It's, it's something need to be jumped to. So is there any speedy step that, I, that we can take? Yes, uh, thank you very much for the question. Yes, and I think I, I thought about this, but not as a prime minister. So, but <laughs> just how to 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 faster the 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 the, the, the speed and, and especially was a, a little concern about uh, the the way we react uh, uh, in uh, during the crisis. Uh, not only this one, but some of the sanitary crisis. Uh, it's always we take some measure. And uh, in, in the terms of the urgency, which is normal and sometimes difficult, so that's why I'm happy to not to be prime minister or minister of public health, because they have to, to take some decision with a lot of uncertainties and uh, it's, it's difficult. And they don't know where is the trade-off, what would be the consequence. But we have to, to, to see that, okay, we have to a little be in advance. What we, we've learned, and it was nice also to hear you, what we learn about, the past crisis on the actual crisis to speed up finally the process, the, the, the process, not only to better prepare for the next one, but to avoid the next one. And this is the way that maybe we can we can speed up. And there is a, uh, some of those questions we can use a lot of uh, lot of tools. Uh, 
because you ask also the question of trade-offs. Uh, and it's difficult to see it because uh, most of economists think about trade-offs. But actually, where are the trade-offs? Um, does do this trade-off really exist? And uh, how do we can measure and how I can uh, so but we can you can use some some tools and uh, many countries, uh, even Thailand, use tools, but they don't use the tools together. I would take two examples: health impact assessment, which engage the community, and environmental impact assessment, which is also engage the community and really in the process. Why not to put, because today to, together we see that they are related. Health and the environment are related and especially in the cities, but not only. So why not using these two tools when, for example, we, uh, we process some problem regarding some uh, uh, development or some coastal uh, problem in the, in, the, in the city, like in Indonesia health impact assessment and environmental impact assessment. We merge the two and this case would be nice because the health would be really at the forefront of the environmental problem. Thank you very much. And um, I really share those, those feelings as, as well. I'm, I'm kind of like, I, I know my, my, my intention of actually changing it in, in speedy ways, it's really actually a difficult one. And um, to Thailand, I might need to change someone out there so that it, it can actually magically make something happen too. So uh, um, since you are one of the co-hosts today, I save you for last and then you can help me close the session by the question as well. Uh, I'm gonna, I'm not gonna make you a next prime minister. I'm gonna make you a Bangkok governor. And uh, to your work, <laughs> everyone's gonna be someone else today. Um, to your work, you pointed out a lot of questions though. Uh, Kim, of those workers, it is not easy to move though. It's not easy to relocate. It's, it's a several process to get done. You are talking about a walkable kind of pathway, which in which both walkable and bikeable need a culture of the of urbanity of these urban people to actually do with that. Otherwise it would be le left dry as of the bike lane in Bangkok as well. So I'm gonna make you run for Bangkok governor and just shoot me, shoot me to buy me a word. What policy would you have? <laughs> Only one. Only one policy that tomorrow we can have one healthy city. You can make sure I have a healthy habitat. Um, let's hear you to the last question of today and perhaps conclude all of the speakers today as well, because Zanun one usually has her famous quote from her senior colleagues that make to make a lot of noise of the community as a strong voice. I remember that from your lecture. Go ahead, Ka Zanun one. Um, thank you, Jan Kavida. As I am a vertical, I, I have a vertical, I cannot go um, very high. Uh, I mean, I, I prefer to live on the uh, lower floor, so it will not be elevated um, by claim, so you can <laughs> be relaxed. <laughs> so um, if I am um, a governor, the first thing I will do is to make our neighborhood, every neighborhood, very pleasant place to live. And uh, ideally, I think uh, it should be as pleasant as uh, even we, we locked down for many months, we still can be very happy and have a good health. So I think uh, the city is a place to live in, not just a place to, to travel or to check in Instagramable, no, we, we should be very happy in the place we live. So that the neighborhood we live, the neighborhood we work, it should be very nice, walkable, a lot of trees, shops, learning space, a place for people to come and, and meet. I think it's, um, it's uh, just a sash, just say, I think it's a very um, small scale, not very sexy, to other governors, <laughs> but I think it's very um, efficient and I think it can help, um, I don't know, to help uh, a lot of people can uh, be more happy, happier in, in the city. 
So um, as uh, just to add, for example, um, why we so obsessed about making the city more walkable. If you can walk, look at uh, Parisian. They are so, I mean, they have a very beautiful legs <laughs> because they walk a lot or they bike a lot. They, they bike, so they have, a, they, even my husband, we're going to travel now with a big luggage. He said, no, 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 taxi is walkable. Look, and he said, I'm spoiled, decadent Asian. <laughs> so um, it's good for health and it's good for economy. Like uh, I try to explain, um, you walk, you can patronize uh, all the shops, um, small shops, not the big department store. This is an inclusive economy in practice. It's good for environment for sure. Um, we, we drive less, so it's less um, pollution. And I think it's, it makes the, 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 the neighborhood uh, stronger because you know who's live next to you, not just like um, grab taxi from your home to um, office like this. It's not that, I don't think we can continue live like this. So I think this is a very important. And uh, uh, you said uh, how to create this culture to, uh, to cultivate this uh, walking or biking culture. I think um, it's like a chicken and egg. Um, I discussed with uh, one of our candidates, Ajahn Chat Chat. I think just, just, make, just make a very beautiful sidewalk, safe, convenient, and very pleasant sidewalk. And look how people change. Because according to our study, um, from 100%, 68% people are walking. Only 30% uh, people use a car. I mean, to, and, and, and people, people tend to walk more uh, when we develop BTS, MRT, BRT, because they cannot stand anymore with the uh, traffic. So I think this is a, this is a push uh, reason. So I think um, if we make the, the sidewalk really, um, how to say, very beautiful, nice with uh, beautiful trees, beautiful lighting, nice bench like this. We, we want to walk, people will walk and the local shops will be like this in Paris. I, I just seen the, the, the statistic in this city, they have uh, the highest local standalone shops per capita, highest in the world. But it doesn't happen automatically, not only beautiful sidewalk, they have a lot of incentive, but look at this. I mean, this is uh, my dream. And just to answer about the, the, the camp um, of the workers, I think it must be treat people, I mean, because uh, we treat them like invisible or invisible group of people. We, we, we don't see them or we prefer not to see them but they need to have a, a proper standard, even they are a, a temporary worker because uh, we exploit them a lot. So this is, I think we should treat differently with the construction site and for um, lower income housing that uh, Ajahn Kudmo uh, Nitya have been working with. I think this is a problem of housing, social housing, which is like, um, unknown for this country. Like my husband said, huh? BMA doesn't take care of uh, housing for people, how possible? Because uh, in Paris, they have like, what 20% of housing stock must be uh, provided for social. I mean, for those who cannot uh, afford expensive house. So I think this is uh, very important. So we have, uh, okay, and people said, oh, we don't have a land. The land is land price is very expensive, but we have a lot of state owned land. So I think if we can reform this, we, we can make e even more than enough to, to host um, six, uh, um, 600,000 of uh, lower income people. Yeah, so this is my question. Yes, yes, I'm going. <laughs> The, the trend is going to strike 
And oh, we can okay. complain because okay, this let, is <laughs> Let me help you end this. Thank you very much for yeah. all the speakers. Yeah. Yeah, this, this is one problem in France. We have a, yes, we have a lot of strikes. A lot of strikes of the trade. One time. Liberté, <laughs> fraternité. We cannot complain even their strike. <laughs> okay, let me close up all the speakers. I get the punchline from all of you. Resilience from below from Biwi, and I have multidisciplinary flexibility from uh, Ruku. I have um, earning the trust, not just talking the trust from Janitayanaka. And then uh, Dr. Moran told me that you perhaps do not have to choose and make the use of all that you have. And my finalist today, she said that you have to make everyone visible and make every voice heard. So by all means, I think today all the speakers can perhaps make the future city one health and that everyone can actually fall in love with their life again one more time. So back to you, MC. Thank you very much for a very constructive discussion for today. Before we really end our session for today, tomorrow, the last day of the One Health and City Conference 2021, and it will be starting at 2 p.m. And we encourage all those who are interested in to um, register beforehand. And okay. On behalf of the organizing committee, we appreciate your participation. Tomorrow is gonna be as fun and constructive as this because we get um, another three distinguished expert panelists, which are um, Associate Professor Raishat Tanta Gan Abha. And once again, Associate Professor Tawida Agamonwed, who will be um, our panelists for tomorrow. And lastly, Mr. Pong Sak Ying Chon Jaren. Thank you very much for all participants and see you virtually again tomorrow. Thank you.